We're going to be continuing with, with the theme of uh, Priscotheologia. Okay? Priscotheologia is uh, the ancient uh, theology. Now, uh, astrotheology is a big part of this. Um, it's probably a third of it. <laughs> Uh, and astrology, which I was dealing with last week, is a big chunk of it too. So, um, continuing with this theme of uh, ancient theology, we're going to honour a truth speaker of the 16th century, because he died in the, on the 17th of February, 1600. Giordano Bruno. Now, Giordano Bruno was a person who spoke about the Prisca theology all the time and he was bringing it to the world. In fact, he brought it to Queen Elizabeth. And Queen Elizabeth was contemplating bringing, uh, making the, the British Isles hermetic. But of course, the, uh, the clergy um, got wind of the, the plot, sent Giordano Bruno a packing back to Italy, and uh, of course made sure that fictional uh, <coughs> Roman Christian religion would continue in their country. What I mean by that is that, um, and as I've proven with my uh, presentations, that Rome has invented the fiction of the historical uh, Jesus Christ <coughs> for purposes of enslavement. Um, astrotheology. Now, when you mention astrotheology, uh, people, people think, I actually um, <clears throat> have seen comments on the internet where people think it's just a recent term and it's just recently been invented by, say, Jordan Maxwell or someone like Michael Tassarian or one of those guys. But um, here's um, Kersey Graves from 1880. 1880. And um, <clears throat> he uses the word astrotheology. This guy also, the Reverend Robert Taylor, uses the expression. And he's from 1830s, okay? Now, first thing that happens is when you talk about astrotheology is that the churchgoers uh, poo-poo the idea. And they deny that Christianity has anything to do with the stars. Uh, the original religio-slash-science religio of this planet you see, uh, the Priscotheologia um, explains that the stars were originally uh, the, uh, the components of nature that were uh, studied and observed with intent to discover our origins and uh, many truths about reality. And what they did was they uh, encoded uh, books uh, writings in which they would um, reveal their discoveries to mankind. So they discovered a lot by observing the stars, you see, the ancient priesthoods. And uh, in doing so, they realised that we were more than connected with the stars. You know, we were very, very connected with the stars. So what developed was a, um, a science whereby if we take note, notice of nature, and the most um, potent aspects of nature would have to be the stars, the lights in the skies. They called them the uh, spirit father fountains of life. And they realised that these um, entities had uh, an influence on us. They observed these influences and uh, recorded them. And um, the Bible the Judeo-Christian uh, work, Hebrew, Christi uh, Greek writings, uh, nothing other than astrotheological themes. Okay? They are stories about the uh, observances of the stars and their behaviour and their cycles, etc. So the first thing they do, the religionists, is um, they deny that... Um, the origin of their, uh, their faith and belief is based on uh, the stars, you see. So what we're going to do is have a look at some of the words and um, designations of the ministers and um, 
the people who uh, practice in the churches. Um, so we've got cardinal, deacon, sexton, monseigneur, sir, nun, minister, pastor, monk, ceremony, bishop, orison, monastery, etc. Uh, cardinal. This is um, in astrology. This is the four cardinal signs. Okay, Aries, Cancer, Libra, Capricorn. A deacon is ten degrees of astrology. Sexton having the word six in it, um, and having to do with uh, astrology, just like bishop is three degrees, ten degrees, three degrees. Uh, Monseigneur, Sir. Sir is just short for the star Sirius because he's the Lord. He's the boss. He's the brightest star in the sky. Yes, Sir. Uh, nun, uh, Minister. Here we see moon and star. Same with pastor. Moon, Ceres, moon. Bishop, already discussed that. Orison, moon, star, monastery. Um, <clears throat> now that's pretty much the uh, designations that these uh, ministers give themselves. Uh, another good one would be uh, elder in the L words. When you look at the L words, you'll notice uh, a lot of um, L in there because of the sun, Elios. You see, in Greek, the sun is called Elios. And in the Jewish system, the Elohim happen to be the planets and the uh, luminaries in the sky, the seven visible orbs. And you see the words such as elect, elite, the elder in the congregation. He's, he is a, he'd be a uh, minister, would he not? A moon star, one who talks about El, Israel, Isis, Ra and Elohim evangelizing, etc., etc. I mean, these are all church words, okay? Um, and so, because the, the sun is, is the El who provides three things to mankind for their existence. Uh, and that would be love, light, and life, undeniably. For that orb has more love for us than any other. It, it's the creator of everything physical in the solar system. And uh, together with the other six are uh, what cause us to manifest in the physical realms. Uh, so we get love, that's very loving. We get light, we get three qualities of light, spiritual, psychic and physical light from the sun, which gives life. Um, and so you see all the L words with the five vowels, anything El, Al, Il, Ul, Ol. Here we have Olympians. Here we have um, bull. Here we have il. That's the definite article in Italian. El is the definite article, um, the um, male gender definite article in Spanish. Male uh, definite gen um, article in Italian. Okay, and we get words like uh, bello in Italian. Um, if, if someone is handsome, you say, oh, bello. Or some, uh, someone's uh, pretty, a girl's pretty, you say, bella. And that comes from the L, okay, because nothing is more pretty than the sun. Especially in the summertime, when he revitalizes the planet. And so, of course, and the Bible is uh, related to Babel. Babel and Bible are the same word. Babel means circle of the sun. The zodiac. Okay? Um, and of course, and it's related to bubble, circle. Bubble, babble, Bible. Um, Bell is Baal, the god Baal. And he also, if you put a, a, an O on the end of that, you get the Italian word for good looking. Bello. Because Baal is the sun, he's glorious, he's Prince Charming. Okay, so these il, el, al, ol, they are all the sun, the el lord. 
So when you hear expressions like the Lord Jesus Christ, Amen, these are all different words for the Son. Okay? Lord, <clears throat> yes, yes means the Son. There we have the, the, the golden orb himself, beautiful, Prince Charming. Bello. And there are the words, the letters. I E S in Greek. I E S is yes. And that's uh, Jesus. Christ, well, Christ is light, king, the king of light, and that's the sun. And Amen or Amun or Om, um, that is the sun. So we've come to a time in, in history that we've. Um, We've begun to understand these things because we've been able to uh, decipher the, uh, the Egyptian uh, holy writings, the, the um, hieroglyphs. And in recent times we've um, been able to uh, expose this story that is in the Bible. Now, we have many uh, great scholars to lean upon. Uh, probably I would say this would be the best work absolutely the best work in terms of astrotheology by the Reverend Robert Taylor. One of his con contemporaries was uh, Thomas Taylor and Thomas Taylor was, um, was uh, a great scholar who um, was interpreting the Greek myths. I'm going to read a little bit out of this later on and also out of this. Contemporaries, this one's um, deciphering the holy Jewish Christian scriptures and this one, the myths. So we, we've got a lot of scholars of that nature. We have um, <clears throat> The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross by uh, John Marco Allegro, one of the Dead Sea scholars, who uh, discovered that uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls were nothing but um, writings about the Essenes, who had Gospels, and were already talking about a suffering servant or a Messiah hundreds of years before the so-called historical Christ. Um, he's come out and uh, explained that, um, that uh, the Bible is based on mythologies and um, the Amanita muscaria mushroom being the, uh, the base for Christianity. Um, <clears throat> they used to take the Amanita muscaria mushroom as the uh, Eucharist, you see, the, the bread of Christ, and they would have out-of-body experiences. And um, so one of the... Dead Sea Scroll Scholars has shared that with the world. Of course, they went after him and, um, and uh, defamed him and, and destroyed his career. Uh, but nonetheless, he was a truth speaker. Here's another truth speaker, Dupuy, a um, contemporary of um, Napoleon Bonaparte, as well as Volney. These guys exposed the astrotheology in the Bible. I'm going to share excerpts and, 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 and um, share um, interesting... Um, information from these scholars today. So it's going to be very eclectic, but there's a lot of uh, interesting information that we're going to expose. Here is the, uh, the Earth, and that would be the equator, Tropic of Cancer, Tropic of Capricorn. Now I'm following a um, a very ancient map, and by the way, a lot of people ask me about where do I get my uh, maps and stuff from. Well, that's the book, you can get that on uh, Amazon, Star Maps. And uh, in fact, it has uh, lots of great ancient math, maps, and uh, a great collection, probably one of the best I've ever seen. It's phenomenal. And so this comes from that book. Uh, here is the sine wave that I've just done. Um, as you can see, there's the equator, and here we have the Tropic of Cancer, and here we have the Tropic of Capricorn. Okay? So um, this sine wave, this is the path that the sun appears to make uh, around the uh, Earth as it goes through the seasons. It's called the ecliptic. Okay, so it's the path that the, um, that the sun takes through the 12 signs of the zodiac. So. Um, there's a little glyph here 
for Aries, which indicates that the sign of Aries begins here, and that would be the 21st of March, the uh, equator, the equinox. And uh, as it rises, as the sun rises in the, the spring skies through uh, March, April and June, it reaches the um, Tropic of Cancer and then it uh, proceeds to decline and wane and goes through Libra and there's the scales of Libra. That's the middle point of the sine wave. Okay? Very important, crucial part of the theologies and a lot of the stuff in the Bible pertains to this area here because the scales of Libra that sit on that equinox there have to do with justice and the fall of the sun as the sun falls down to the winter months below the equator. The scales have judged the sun. So that point there is very interesting and these are the cardinal points. Aries, the equinox, Cancer, the uh, solstice, uh, Libra, the equinox, and Capricorn, the solstice. And it comes back through, through Aquarius, the water bearer, through Pisces, and then back up into Aries. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm following that. So we start here at uh, Aries, and we go up to Cancer, and then down to Capricorn, and then come back up again. And uh, that's the sine wave. It's 23 and a half degrees and 23 and a half degrees. Now, so what you've got here is the solstice. And here we have also the solstice. So these, this would be the uh, summer months and this would be the winter months in the Northern Hemisphere. And uh, March the 21st is over here. June 21st is there at the solstice. September 21st at the equinox. And December 21st, the solstice. These are the crucial points. There's a lot to be said about these points and you will, you will see how uh, important they are in the scriptures. Okay? What I'm going to show today is that um, the Gospels of Matthew and uh, Luke start from... Start from December the 21st and finish with December the 21st, whereas Mark and John started Aries. Okay, so we're going we're going to show that, and um, with the aid of this book here, the secret truth about Jesus, the Gospel and the Zodiac, by the Reverend Bill Darlison, and in here he shows how the 16 chapters of the Gospel of Mark uh, run through, starting from Aries, run through and finish in Pisces. Okay? And of course I've uh, dealt on that in my uh, astro-theological presentations and um, shown how most of the cycles begin with this point in the, um, in the year. The equinoxes are so important that on this particular day and its opposite, September the 21st, these two equinoxes, the sun splits the day between 12 hours of darkness and 12 hours of light, perfectly balanced. That balance is measured by the priesthoods and they consider it to, to be a sacred day that point of equilibrium. Equilibrium is always respected in nature. It's always respected. So you see these two spheres, the two polarities of light, summer, and darkness, winter, are balanced at these points. Very, very powerful points in the year, the equinoxes. In fact, they, they are so respected that all our religious, religious observances are uh, take place at these four points, at the four points of the cross. Here we have the, the Passover of the Jews and Easter. Here we have uh, Judgment Day, Rosh Hashanah, um, the Festival of Tabernacles or the Festival of Booths. And here we have the Holy Saturnalia and the Christmas period. 
where the, the, um, the ancients would mourn for Saturn. That was the Saturnalia, and, uh, or Saturn's brother, the sun. They would mourn for the sun because he was going down to his death on the 21st of December. And so um, Macrobius, in his famous work, the Saturnalia, talks about this festival and its origins. And uh, in doing so, he revealed a lot about um, the old astrotheological system. In fact, he revealed that every one of the names of the heroes, including Jesus, mean the sun. And here are some of the, um, here are some of the names of those uh, ancient gods. Janus, Bacchus, Yeus, Apollo, Julio, Delios, Loxias, Phobus, Phanes, Lucius, Sabasius, Liber, Ebulis, Dionysus, Yao, Hades, Mars, Meton, Mercury, Draco, Asclepius, Hercules, Serapis, Adonis, Attis, Osiris, Horus, Pan, Jupiter, Saturn, Adad. Interesting. So we'll get back to that. But um, what we have here now is the, um, the uh, cycle that causes the Gospels to be told. So what we have is, according to um, Reverend Bill Dalson, as we begin in Aries, I'm going to share some scriptures with you, which... Um, prove the, uh, the astrological uh, aspects of the Gospels. Uh, so beginning with um, Aries, the deacons of Aries, uh, it talks about Perseus and Cetus and um, Andromeda. So if we go to Aries at the head, remember Aries is always the start of this system because it's in the head. Uh, we see there's Perseus, Cassopia, um, and Andromeda is always associated with Pisces, but the stars overlap um, with this zodiac sign here. Uh, here we have Taurus, Orion, Eridanus, and Auriga. Okay, so, and these are the deacons. You have the northern deacons here. Um, so, for instance, Scorpio has three northern deacons. It doesn't have any southern deacons. Whereas Libra has a northern deacon and it has some southern deacons. Okay? And these are, there's 15 in the southern and 21 in the northern. And they make up, they make up 36 extra zodiacal signs. Okay? Now one of the first things that uh, is spoken about in Aries um, is the apostle... Uh, or rather, John the Baptist calls um, Jesus, um, the, um, talks about the baptism of fire. Well, that would be the fire of Aries. Okay, so that's the first hint. As the, as the sun comes into Aries, there's the fire aspect. And um, <clears throat> we'll just have a look at that um, part in the Gospel of uh, Mark. It says, I have baptised you with water, but he will baptise you with Holy Spirit. And, of course, Matthew and Luke use the word fire in that, right? But the Spirit has to do with the baptising uh, in Aries because what happens in Aries is there is the river Eridanus goes through there from the sign of Taurus next door. And the Eridanus is the Jordanus where uh, Jesus is baptised. So that's where John baptises Jesus immediately and the gospel begins there. And I'm talking, that's the first, there's Saint Mark, that's the first passage in the Bible where Jesus is baptised. There's no nativity in uh, either Mark or John. There's no nativity scene. Whereas Matthew and Luke, they begin with the nativity when the son is a baby on the 25th of December, it has to grow and then be baptised in the Jordan River in the head of Aries. 
Um, <clears throat> And um, here's another interesting scripture right there after that passage. It says, Immediately afterwards, the Spirit drove him out of the wilderness, and he remained there for 40 days and was tempted by Satan. He was with the wild beasts, and the angels looked after him. Well, the wild beasts would be the beasts of the zodiac. You see, it says that Jesus was with the wild beasts. That's where the sun is. Lions, scorpions, etc. Okay, so they are Aryan features. Um, then in uh, chapter, verse 17, Andrew cast a net in the lake, for they were fishermen. Now, uh, some translations use the word uh, hired men. Well, that has to do with the stars in the sign of Aries in the deacon of Aries, Aries that, are called, uh, that are called the hired men. Let me read a portion of this. The combat between Perseus and Cetus mirrors the challenge to the powers of evil which Jesus makes in these early chapters of Mark. He is tempted by Satan in the wilderness. He casts out an unclean spirit. He declares that the kingdom of Satan is at an end. Uh, clearly and he implies that Satan has been bound, clearly reflecting the names of two stars in Cetus, Menkar, the chained enemy, and Diphda, the overthrown, the thrust down. Isn't that interesting? Then there's a star in uh, Perseus called Algol, and this is called by the Hebrews Algol as Rosh Ha-Satan. And it's supposed to be, it says here that... Um, it's the demon star and the blinking demon, the demon's head, is said to have been thus called from its rapid and wonderful variations. The Hebrews call Algol as Rosh HaSatan, Satan's head. Head. Ares, the head. Uh, astrologers, of course, said that it was the most unfortunate, violent and dangerous star in the heavens. So the name of Satan appears a lot in the early chapters of Mark in the Aries sector, okay? And, of course, because of the stars, Algol in Perseus, the, the, the star that they call the most violent one in the skies. And so that explains all the, uh, the um, mentions of Satan in the first chapters of Mark, okay? Um, another incident happens in Mark 1.29, and this is the incident. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the house of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. So... Simon Peter's mother-in-law has a fever. Well, Simon's other name is Cephas. And you'll notice that Cephas, uh, Cephas in, in um, Pisces is also merging in with Aries. You see, that, that's how it works. So Cephas is in here. And Cephas is another name for the Apostle Peter. Right? Uh, and Andrew would be Andromeda. Right? Andrew. <laughs> so these are in the first chapters of Mark, right? Dealing with uh, the March Aries sector. So the mythological Cassopia was the wife of Cephas and the mother of Andromeda, whom Perseus had married after releasing her from the rock to which he had been chained by the sea god Poseidon. Cassopia was eventually translated to the sky by her enemies, the sea nymphs, but because of her vanity and arrogance, was placed so close to the pole that she appears to be lying prone. Well, the mother, the mother of the one chained to the rock, see, Cassopia was chained to the rock, well, the rock is Cephas, Peter. Peter's called the rock. <laughs> is Cassopia. So the one chained or married to the rock, Peter, is Cassopia. 
the reclining woman. Cassopia's husband is Cephas, another name for Peter, the rock. Uh, and her daughter is Andromeda, uh, which names which are hinted at in the names Andrew and Cephas. Now, another thing that um, Bill Darlison points out in this book is that uh, unlike the Gospel um, Mark, the Gospel John, which also begins in Aries, in the first chapter of John, uh, the Gospel of John, John the Baptist says, look, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, pointing to the very same nature. Uh, of that gospel to Mark's gospel. Unfortunately, Mark doesn't use that expression, but all the, other, all the others do. <laughs> and if it had of, that would really just put the icing on the cake, wouldn't it? All right, so that's um, Aries. Let's have a look at Taurus and see if we can see some uh, themes there in the uh, early chapters. By the way, I'll just put that up for the camera <clears throat> to pick up. Um, this comes straight out of the book and uh, it shows the, um, <clears throat> the different sectors uh, of the Gospels. So Aries is from the first chapter to the third chapter, okay? And it's dealing with the baptism of Jesus, the beginning of ministry, theme of newness, 12 apostles as new Israel, sense of urgency, daring and defiance. In the Zodiac, the key words would be uh, sign of the spring equinox, initiation, action, impulsiveness, assertiveness, pioneering, associated with the head. And you will find all of these perfectly on cue in those chapters of Mark and dealing with the sign of Aries. Okay? Uh, Taurus, parables of growth, Agricultural Im imagery, parable of light. Now, because of the special stars in Taurus, Taurus has um, a cluster of stars called the Pleiades, which are the lights. Okay, so we notice now in the um, in the fourth chapter of Mark, which I'm going to be reading from, the the theme is dealing with um, uh, light and also the parables of the seeds. Because in Taurus, Taurus is the time of the year when you take your bull out and plough. So you notice that in the fourth chapter of Mark, there's a lot of ploughing being done, a lot of seed sowing, and a lot of talk about lights. Because Taurus has those beautiful Pleiades and the Hyades and Orion and all those bright stars. <coughs> so, um, <coughs> the parable of the light under the bushel which follows the sower, does not have the Taurian imagery of growth and productivity except in rather an oblique sense. But it is related to Taurus nevertheless, because in addition to its association with the earth and with agriculture, Taurus has always considered by the ancients to be connected with light. Um, for instance, Venus rules Taurus, and Venus is phosphorus. She is the bright morning star, and she is one of the brightest orbs. In fact, she is the third brightest orb in the sky. That's one pointer to the fact that it's dealing with Taurus. Uh, another one is um, the principal star of the Hyades group, situated in the eye of the bull, was called by Ptolemy. Lampadias, that would be lamp, lampadias, the torch. So you see, Jesus will be talking about light, don't hide your light, show your light. <clears throat> Venus, the ruler of Taurus and the most brilliant sight in the evening and morning sky after the moon was called by the Greeks phos, phos meaning light, and by the Romans, Lucifer, the light bearer. So no wonder chapter 4 deals with light. To the ancient occultists, Venus was the planet of inner light, illumination. Uh, 
uh, <clears throat> Aristophanes called it Plias Epistoros, the seven-starred Pleiades. So we're talking about the Pleiades now. Although he said that one of them is Panaphanes, all invisible. One of the stars of the Pleiades is hidden according to the myth. The Pleiades were the seven daughters of Atlas, who had been changed into stars by Pleione. Six of them had been married to gods, but the seventh, Merope, had married a mortal. So her light was dim and rarely seen, all of which strikingly reflects the parable of the lamp in Mark 7, 21, 22. Now take note, this is very interesting because we're talking about the seven sisters here, the Pleiades. Okay, now, you ever notice that? Subaru, that means the Pleiades, the seven sisters. Now, when you look up at the Pleiades, they, they're magnificent. They look exquisite, like a jewel in the sky, and they correspond to the pineal gland, okay? Because here they are in Taurus, Pleiades. They're supposed, to, they're supposed to be more up toward here, actually, these around this area here, uh, because Taurus rules the, the lower part of the head. Um, but you will only notice six. There are not seven because uh, one of them has had their lights dimmed. So let's notice what uh, Mark chapter 4, 21 has to say, shall we? He said to them, Do you bring a lamp? Do you bring a, in a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? In, instead, don't you put it on its stand? For whoever is hidden, for whatever is hidden, is meant to be disclosed. And he uses the word here, Phanerothe in Greek. And whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. Phaneron. If, if anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. Well, as I, I just read before about Erastathenes, he called one of those uh, stars the exact same word that Mark uses for the dimming of the light, which is Phanophanes. So Erastophanes called this, this star Phanophanes, the all invisible. Interesting that Mark should use the exact same word for the, the dim star in the Pleiades. Uh, still on the, the, the Taurus uh, sign, we need to um, focus our attention on that. Um, <clears throat> of course, agricultural Im imagery and the parable of light. Oh, thanks, George. Yeah, beautiful. <laughs> That'll help that. <laughs> Good stuff. Um, <clears throat> this is also in Mark. Okay. He also said, This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up. The seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it, because the harvest has come. Again he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of the seeds on earth, yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such branches that the birds can perch in the shade. So notice the theme there of agricultural imagery, uh, parables of growth, and this is, these are the themes of the, um, of the fourth chapter of Mark, right on cue with Aries the first, Taurus the second. And it gets better. Mark 4, 10 to 12. When he was done, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside everything is said in parables, so that they may be ever seeing, but never perceiving, and ever hearing, but never understanding. 
otherwise they might turn and be forgiven. How about Gemini? All right, so we come to Gemini. <clears throat> We've done Aries, Taurus, and now Gemini, the twins. What themes of Gemini do we have in the Bible in the uh, fourth to sixth chapter of Mark? Themes of duality, man with a legion, the Tunis, <laughs> of Geminis, Geminians, um, the flow of blood and the cure of Jairus's daughter, the apostles sent out in twos, uh, Herod's uh, vacillation. So, and here they are, short journeys, has to do with the third house of, of astrology. Uh, siblings and relationships, of course. Well, that's the Geminis, and we're going to see this in the Gospel. Indecision and communication. Now, I'm, I'm really just picking the, the choice bits here because I've, I've got the whole thing to go through. Uh, so it's probably going to take about a half an hour, but, and I want to discuss many, many other themes. I don't want to just uh, discuss the Gospel of Mark, showing that Mark starts in Aries with the baptism, and Pisces with the, the death, okay, the sign of the cross. So uh, Gemini, there are a few details in the story which underline its Geminian theme. The word for the storm used by Mark is Laelops, but Laelops is also the name of the hound of Acteon in Greek mythology, a name associated with the constellation Canis Major, one of the deacons of Gemini. Right? So Jesus tells the storm to cease with the word Siopa, be quiet, echoing the Spartan name for Gemini, Tosio, and the cushion upon which Jesus' head was resting along, believed to be a detail provided by Peter, echoes the headgear of the Geminian twins or the flames of fire which were supposed to issue from their heads. So that's basically, basically the themes of those chapters, dealing with um, these uh, extra zodiacal signs. There's um, Gemini there, Canis Major, um, Canis Menor, and Lepus, the hare, which, which is what the, the fourth chapter of uh, Mark deals with. Okay. Um, there's also the incident of the Legion, who, um, who says, my name is Legion, and for we are many. That has to do with the, uh, the duality aspect of Geminians, okay? Let's see if there are some other points in Gemini, some good points that I want to... Okay, well, let's go to uh, this miracle of the uh, Jairus and the woman with the blood flow. So, after he put them out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kumi, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk, and she was twelve years old. At this they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to tell anyone about this and told them to give us something to eat. Well, uh, this incident happened immediately after Jesus was touched by a woman who had a, a flow of blood which was for 12 years. So Jairus' daughter was 12 years old and the other incident immediately before that had to do with 12 years, indicating uh, a twin parable. Okay. The most obviously Geminian feature of Jira the story of Jairus' daughter is the way in which it is told. It is the only miracle story in the Gospels which combines two quite separate elements. Uh, elements. Nehemiah writes, What we have here is without precise parallel in the Gospel, an incident broken into by another incident which takes place in the middle of it. Right. In addition, however, we should consider the name Jarius, Yarius, which means appropriately Jehovah enlightens, but which also bears more than a passing resemblance to the name of the brightest star in the night sky, 
Sirius. Serios. The dog star, which is found in Canis Major, right? That's where Sirius is, in the dog star. Um, one of the Geminian deacons, and whose name means the chief one, the leader, Jarius, we are told, uh, the leader or ruler of the synagogue. And as Ptolemy reminds us, the heliacal rising of Sirius at the summer solstice presaged the beginning of the Egyptian New Year and the flooding of the Nile, thus, concerning, uh, thus connecting this star with the constant menstruating, constantly menstruating woman. In addition to being a possible zodiacal reference, Mark's double use of the number 12 provides us with further evidence that we are meant to link the two females and that this double story is not just a narrative accident. The woman with the flow, the blood flow, has been sick for 12 years. The little girl is 12 years old. The, constant, the contrast between the girl and the older woman reflects two of the deacons of Gemini, Canis Major and Canis Menor. Okay, and there's also the mention of Sodom and Gomorrah, the Twin Cities, in Mark 6.11. Okay? Now, I have to apologise because this is sort of a little bit sort of dull and boring because it's real nitty-gritty names of stars and everything like this. And this guy has done a lot of homework and it's a beautiful, exquisite book the way he's put it together. And he's mixed astrology with astronomy, with astrotheology and beautiful metaphysical themes. It's just such a rich book. I wish I could just spend the whole, t you know, four hours on this, but I just have to fly through it. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm just going to really fly through because we've only done three, three of those uh, signs, okay? Um, but there's some real, oh, look, there's some real obvious ones. Cancer is um, <clears throat> themes of uh, nurture, the motherliness of the cancer sign with the moon in it, um, food and stomach concerns, uh, etc. Well, that's all in there. Um, the boat is in Cancer, the boat Argo. So Argo is the ship that is up here, you see, and that is, according to the Venerable Bede, um, that is the Ark of Noah. And interesting that um, two deacons of Gemini are Canis Major and Canis Minor. The two deacons of uh, Cancer are Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. And Noah, in his boat, on top of Mount Ararat, brought in animals two of two. The only place where two ofs occur in the whole zodiac is right where, right here where Argo is in the constellation of Cancer. So you have Cancer here, Argo the ship, Ursa Minor, Ursa Major. In Gemini, you have Canis Major and Canis Menor. And, so, and, there's, and, there's, um, and there's the ship right there, bringing in the twos and the twos. Okay? Now, I, I didn't make that up. You want to read the, uh, the Venerable Beads. Uh, and he was uh, from the 6th century, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so... Um, and it also... There is the incident in the cancer sector where Jesus talks to the Syrophoenician woman about um, not giving uh, children's food to the dogs. Well, that would be because can it, the, um, the dogs are over here. Uh, in fact, Marcus Manilius, he mentions in this book, Marcus Manilius places one of the dogs, Procyon, in the sector of Cancer and not Gemini, as modern astrologers do. So there's the Cancer in the Gospel. Uh, Leo. Interesting. Leo. <clears throat> Let's have a good look at Leo, Virgo and Libra. Libra. In Leo, as I've discussed before in my astrotheology uh, presentations, there's Cancer, there's Leo and there's uh, Libra. Um, on the 6th of August, which happens uh, right about here, the middle of the hottest part of the year, on the 6th of August, the Catholic Church calls that day the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. The 6th of August. It's the middle of Leo. It's the middle of summer. 
it would be, and the dog uh, Sirius is behind the sun, so you've got the, the dog days. There's a famous painting by Raphael. This is very famous. And there's Jesus Christ at the Transfiguration. And there's um, the, his apostles there, and they saw, um, I think it's um, Moses and, and Elijah. Okay? So let's have a listen, let's have a look at and see how, how um, Mark ties that in with the, uh, the sign of Leo. So on a journey to Caesarea Philippi, Jesus asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? The text goes on. They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Well, Jesus takes them to an unusually high mountain. And that's the unusually high mountain. And uh, it says, Six days, six days after, in fact, I'll read that from the Bible. This is too, uh, too good to be lost. Uh, here's uh, Mark uh, chapter 9. So you see, it's, he's going to be dealing with the transfiguration and the glory. So all these themes are dealt with in, uh, in Mark chapter 8 and chapter 9 in the Leo sector of the Gospel of Mark. Okay? Mark 9 verse 2. Six days later, right? remember the 6th of August is the Transfiguration Day, and they've, they're giving you a hint. Six days later, uh, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain where he could be alone, where they could be alone by themselves. There, in their presence, he was transfigured. His clothes became dazzlingly, dazzlingly white, whiter than any earthly bleacher could make them. Elijah appeared to them with Moses and they were talking with Jesus. There you have it. Elijah and Moses, Peter, Andrew and James on the mountain. Six days after he was transfigured. Well, that's the 6th of August. I mean, it's, pretty, it's, it's really blatant. When you know what you're looking for and you're reading the Gospels and you know the stars that are there and what they do, and what they mean, you can't mistake this. There is no excuse for churchgoers to start going, oh yeah, but that's a, you're looking into it, and it, it's not. It is there. And if you're not seeing it, it's because you're not looking. Simple as that. Now, let's see if I can chug along a little bit more. Um, interesting. We have another similar painting by Titian, around about the same time as the Raphael. That's the Virgin and the assumption of the virgin, virgin on the 15th of August, just a, a week after the Transfiguration. Wonder what's going on. Well, that would be the sun in Leo, because he rules in Leo and he's transfigured in Leo. Um, Virgo, uh, I made a big mistake before, didn't I? That's Virgo, not Libra. Libra is here. Yeah, I confused you, didn't I? <laughs> um, Virgo, on the 15th of August, disappears behind the sun. That's the assumption of the Virgin. Because on the 8th of September, over here, she gets reborn again, doesn't she? That's the nativity. Because she reappears. You see, when the sun is in a sign, the sign disappears. You can't see it because, well, for instance, we're in, um, today's the 13th of November. That's Scorpio territory. Now, it's, uh, what's the time? It's two o'clock. So the sun is above us. Behind the sun is the scorpion. You, you cannot see it in November. It's gone. And so that's why the Virgin Mary ascends and then she's born again. The nativity of the Virgin. Yeah, it's all, and it's all on cue. It's, it's, um, all right, let's see what uh, Virgo has. Virgo has uh, teaching about humility, little children, warning against passivity and service. Because uh, the sixth house, uh, or, or Virgo, Virgoans are very service-oriented. It's the sign of service. Okay? So in the Gospel, Jesus is talking about service serve one another, 
etc. If anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and servant of all. So there's the theme of service. Uh, if anyone causes one of these little ones, who, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. So that's also Virgo and themes. All right, let's move on. Let's, I know I'm going to regret taking chunks out of this because there are so many good points, but I, you just can't. All I can do is show you some choice bits and if the subject interests you, I would be getting this book. Um, it's just phenomenal. Okay, Libra. The entry of the sun into Libra marks the autumnal equinox in the northern hemisphere when day and night are equal once again. This is the midpoint of the year, the moment of equilibrium, when the forces symbolised by the day and the night are in perfect counterpoise. This has happened before, of course, when the sun entered Aries in the springtime. But there is a difference between these opposite but complementary point, points. At the spring equinox, the point of poise occurs before the daylight begins to dominate. In the autumn, this is reversed and the balance point presages the forthcoming massing of the darkness. The eternal interplay of light and darkness is symbolised by in the zodiac itself, which on one level is nothing more than the yearly cycle projected on the sky. The first six signs then come under the dominion of daylight. The first six signs come under the dominion of daylight. <coughs> uh, and can be said to represent the light of individual consciousness struggling to establish its identity. This process is associated with the sun, the giver of light. It begins in Aries, the sign of the sun's exaltation, and reaches its climax in sun-ruled Leo. The signs which follow the autumnal equinox, however, are characterised by the gathering darkness and have to do with the group to which individuality has to be incorporated, if not submerged. These are social signs uh, which begin with Libra, the sign of the sun's fall or depression, and which reach their point of maximum power in Aquarius, the sign in modern astrological jargon of the sign's detriment. Uh, sorry, the sun's detriment. Interesting. <clears throat> in ancient Egypt, Libra was associated with Maat, the goddess of cosmic harmony and justice whose special task was to weigh the hearts of the dead on the scales of justice, balanced against an ostrich feather, and she is usually depicted with a feather in her headdress. Those who failed her test were heavy-hearted, those who passed light-hearted. Among the Greeks, notably Hipparchus, Libra was Eugos, the yoke, the very word used by Matthew in a passage immediately following Jesus' declaration that God has revealed the secrets of the kingdom to infants. Mark uses a word from the same root, sunzeo gumi. I hope I got that right. Uh, when he writes, What God has joined, yoked together, let no man separate. separate. So, Hipparchus called this sign the yoke, and Mark is talking about the yoke of marriage, right on cue with Libra. But there's a lot more. We're going to show, uh, see that in a minute. Among the Jews, the tribe of Issachar, described in Jacob's blessing as a strong ass, crouched down between two burdens, is generally associated with Libra. The glyph, the glyph of Libra, What's that? that? That's the sun setting. Oh, sun setting. Because this is a 24-hour clock too, of course. Remember, remember, on the 21st of March and, and September, the sun is balanced, right? It's perfectly balanced. So 
On that day, and only on that day, or those two days rather, does the sun rise at 6 a.m. and set at 6 p.m. Only on those two days. Okay? So, so 6 o'clock goes here, 12, 6 and 12. This is a daily cycle and it's a yearly cycle. And of course during the day there is more light than during the night. Just like there is more light in summer than there is in winter. So those two cycles are described by this, by this graph. Uh, but here, this is the middle point. This is the point where in the human body, um, Libra is the kidneys. So the sine wave is going through the body <coughs> in, the, um, in the scale of the balance. You see the sun setting there? Okay, when you, when you look at that, So that sun's signal that it sends yearly and daily fractally goes through our body in many, many fractals. It goes through the atoms, it goes through everything. It's the same fractal. This, it, this is the wheel, this is the cycle, this is what is going on all the time. Right? Uh, and the sun's telling you that. The sun, the sun tells us that in its path of the ecliptic. The ecliptic runs straight through our bodies. That's the ecliptic. So as above, so below. So when the sun is in Aries, it's in the head. When it's in Taurus, it's in this part. What does that mean? Well, it means it's, it's giving its polarity to that part of your physical body. So it'll, you'll, it'll, it'll manifest physically. Usually Taurians have got nice strong necks. It shows in the neck. It actually shows. Um, but it also shows with their ruling planet Venus, you know. Um, it also shows in, you know, spiritual and psychological things too. Um, philosophers, many philosophers, as I showed last week in the presentation on astrology, uh, are Taurians. Most of the famous t uh, philosophers in history are Taurian because they want to speak. speak. You know, that's where the sun is. Geminians are, are, are in, the, in the lungs and in, and in the arms. You see the way they use their arms, etc., etc. So that's the path of the ecliptic. And it's defining everything. Wherever the sun makes that signal, fractally, which is everywhere, it defines the, the bodies that it, that it gives life to. All right? and, and, and the sun and the, and the six planets, the, the seven visible orbs, they are responsible for all of it. And you'll find that Mark, the Gospel of Mark, is clearly showing us um, encrypted, beautiful encrypted wisdom about that cycle. It's clearly there. It is absolutely clearly there. Let's have a look at Libra, shall we? Now, I want to focus... This chart comes from the book, comes straight out of the book, and I want to focus on these three signs here. Okay, Leo has three deacons, Virgo three deacons, Libra has three deacons. Okay, um, the first one is Hydra, the fleeing serpent. Crater is the cup, the Holy Grail that we drink from when we come down from cancer and we get intoxicated. The crater is always here. Uh, Corvus and it's explained in the book that Corvus is also the crow, right? Uh, sorry, the, crow, the, the, uh, the cock, the rooster, okay? Virgo has Coma, Centaurus, the horse, uh, Bootes, the shepherd, and Libra has Crooks, the cross, the southern cross, um, the wolf, the wolf of the night, and the crown. That would be the crown of thorns. So what's going on is this. Remember that, that point of equi equilibrium. There she is, the just one, balancing the day perfectly. And there's the Southern Cross where the sun gets crucified. This is the big crucifixion, by the way. This is the one where the sun is plunged into the darker polarity. 
So that's big judgment. In fact, that day there is called Judgment Day by the Jews. Okay? And there's a lot of other reasons why it's judgment. I mean, the Egyptians, when you die, they call it westing because you're going down in the west where the sun sets. And the stars, when they go beyond the horizon, they die. They're born in the east. There they die. So this is the place of death. Libra is always there at 6 p.m. every day, judging stars and suns. Every planetary orb is judged by the scales. You see, this is the science that we've, we, were, we were given, the hermetic science of the Priscatologia. And uh, the priestcraft has made a, a mess of it, teaching literal rubbish stories about it. You know, like Humpty Dumpty is a real egg. <laughs> okay? Yeah. <laughs> um, sounds like a Monty Python skit, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. So um, <clears throat> there's the crown. Uh, crown. It's also in uh, Libra, Corona. By the way, I'll just show you them here. Uh, let's do this. Leo in the heart. And the, the main star there is Corleones. And you remember the godfather, Corleone? Corleone is the heart of the lion, the core of the lion, Corleone. Uh, and, and that's the main star there in Leo, because Leo is in the heart. The sun lives in the heart, the middle kingdom. Okay? The three planets, the masculine ones are above, and the three feminine ones are below here, the, the three lower chakras. Okay? So when you're dealing with Leo, you've got Hydra the serpent, the crater, the holy grail, the cup, and the crow. Um, Virgo has the, the horse. Pay attention because all of these nine deacons are spelled out in the Gospel of Mark around about the time of the sun passing through Libra. Okay? Uh, Coma Bernices with her hair. Booties, her husband Joseph, that's Mary, Virgin Mary and Joseph, the shepherd. He's the shepherd, but it's Joseph. And he has a red star, Arcturus. That's the, um, that's the bear. In the northern hemisphere, see these northern stars? The brightest star is Arcturus. All right? You see the California flag with the bear and the red star above it? That's the bear. All right? He rules the northern skies. There's the crown, Corona Borealis. That's the crown, the thorns that the sun wears as it goes through Libra and gets crucified. That's the cross that he's crucified on. And the wolf, the other word for that sign is the victim. The victim is the sun. Gets judged at the scales, crown of thorn, there's the cross. Here is the shepherd. As you'll see, I'll, I'll, we'll go through that, etc. What happens there in Libra, the sun gets judged to go down to hell. There's the wolf there, the victim dies on a cross, gets a crown of thorns. Before that, in the Gospel, this is, these are the chapters. So you can see chapter 16, 14, 14, 11, 11, 14, 15, 15, 15. Um, so it, it's carrying those, the themes around about that part of the Gospel where it would be. Um, so the fleeing serpent is where Jesus defeats death. The cup is, he took the cup, in chapter 14, verse 23, there's the cup. The son takes the cup because the son gets intoxicated now. It's got a, Jesus is getting intoxicated, takes the cup. Um, and before the cock crows three times, that, that's mentioned in 1430. Uh, and there's the, the, the crow on cue. Coma, the infant, the branch, the desired one. And others cut down branches. Blessed is he. So as Jesus came in procession to be crucified. They cut down branches. Well, that's the branches of uh, Coma. Uh, Centaurus, Jesus enters Jerusalem on a cult. There's a cult here. The centaur is, belongs to Virgo. The, the centaur and the southern cross is right over here. Okay, So they are closely connected, those two constellations. There's also two cults over here, remember? I don't know whether you remember, but there's the Asinellus Borealis and Asinellus Australis in Gemini when Jesus comes into Jerusalem to be crucified. Well, this is what he's doing. There are four crucifixions. But this one's the big judgment one. 
Okay, there's the cult that he enters. He enters on a cult. The great shepherd, I will smite the shepherd. That's in Mark 14, 27. Um, and then the, the cross, as I've already shown in those graphs, the cross, the victim and the crown. These are all themes to do with the crucifixion. There's some, some choice stuff in this book. For instance, uh, in Capricorn it talks about Saturday because Saturn rules Capricorn. And it says, the Jewish Sabbath is Saturday, Saturn's day. We noted earlier that Judaism was born when the equinoctial point entered the constellation Aries. And there is no doubt that Aryan imagery of rams, goats, sheep, sacrifices and circumcision play a major role in the liturgical practices of Judaism. But the other cardinal signs, Cancer, Libra, Capricorn, feature prominently in the development of Judaism. Libra, the polar opposite of Aries, the sign of covenants and law. Cancer, the sign of home and diet and mother. Capricorn, the sign of duty, service, social responsibility and the father. See, mother, moon, Capricorn, father, Saturn. And, and when you do your houses, you'll find that the fourth house is, deals with mother, right? And the tenth house with honours and duty and service and, and authority and prestige and father because Saturn is the father. You see the polarities. We have to work out the polarities in all of this to understand the science. Once you start doing that, you can navigate through all of these books. You can read the Upanishads, you can read the Eddas, whatever, and you'll know what you're talking about, man. The characters are always the same. In the Bible, the characters are always the seven heroes, the seven that go manifesting, the Elohim, and they manifest in the space of 12. While Libra is the sign which symbolises the law's origin. And why? Well, because... Libra is always to do with judgment and law. This is law, you know, when you get your heart weighed on that scale in Libra. While Libra is in the sign which symbolises the law's origin and purpose, Capricorn symbolises its operation and enforcement, legalism. Concern for the letter of the law is therefore Capricornian. Similarly, while Christianity is a Piscean religion, it also relates clearly to the other mutable signs. Now get this, right? Christianity is saying is, is a uh, Piscean religion, but it also relates to the other signs. Sagittarius, uh, Gemini, and um, Virgo. How? Well, uh, Virgo, Gemini, and Sagittarius. <coughs> it's, it's emphasis on virginity and celibacy are Virgoan. Its elaborate and divisive theology is Geminian, as are the letters which constitute a good portion of the Christian scriptures. And its missionary zeal and sacerdotalism are Sagittarian. Simple as that. All right, look, there's a lot of choice stuff in here, and uh, I'm afraid I'm just going to have to uh, leave it, because we're going on to some more stuff. Let's have a look at some science now a little bit. Let's have a look at some S words, shall we? There's the S. We've got uh, <coughs> serpent, spiral, and sine wave. Right? Now, the serpent is also a septenary. Those words are interchangeable in the mythologies. In fact, they have the same root word. And spiral also has to do with spirit. And sine wave has to do with sin. Okay? These are the six S words that we need to nut out and understand in order to, to get all this. Because we've got to bring in the metaphysics and you've got to bring in the, um, the, uh, the intention of the priesthood into this science. They didn't do this to, um, you know, entertain themselves on the, on the weekend. They did this so that many, many layers of wisdom would be found in, the, in their holy works. And that way they would sort out, you know, the people from the, 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 the courtyard of the Gentiles, right? Gentiles basically meaning people who are not really spiritual, serious, not serious. 
you know, pagans or that's, in fact, that's what they used to call pagans, and that's very derogatory because it, it, it shouldn't mean anything bad. Um, but the Romans used to say, all oh, the hillbilly pagans. Pagano meant someone who lived out in, the, out in the sticks, you know, country hick. So that's why it's derogatory, but it isn't. Their worship was based on this. Um, but um, those levels were put in there so that he who has ears and eyes to see would look deeper and dig deeper. That's why it's called esoteric or occult, the Prisca Theologia. Because, you know, you ain't going to just give it to someone who um, abuses that information. It's like you're giving, uh, you know, a $1,000 um, iPhone to your nine-year-old son who's known for breaking everything you've given him, right? Well, you wouldn't do it, would you? You'd probably get a cheap phone and give it to them or something like that. So, uh, so wisdom is supposed to be respected. And this is how you respect it. When you hide it and you give it to people who deserve it enough. And they did a wonderful job in doing this. This sine wave represents time. And the seven, the seven fellows that go through there, the seven planets, they, seven represents time and this represents space. You see, this is the space that they're allowed to go in. These are the titans. And, um, and, and as they go, they always make these sine waves, right? Um, and so this represents the flow of time. And that's what sin is. Sin is, these, everything is spirals, okay? So, so this, this, this spiral is not exactly uh, two-dimensional. It's three-dimensional, which makes it a helix, okay? Helical. Um, but... As it does that, the spiral, it, it actually manifests physical bodies. And that's the spirit that it's talking about, the spirit behind the spiral. And it always is serpentary or a septenary. Okay, seven is the number of nature. Let me just read some choice information from uh, Who is This King of Glory? This is a beautiful book by Alvin Boyd Kuhn. If you ever want to get into the deep, deep stuff of this and what the Bible was really written for, this guy explains many beautiful things, okay? So we have the four elements. And he talks about these numbers that appear in the Bible, 4, 3, 12, 7, always those numbers, 40. Why? Well, it's because of, because of time units which describe the spiral, the serpent. The sine wave, the sin that we're in. You see, when you get caught in time, um, when you have, when you, when you're full of sine waves, you're you're sinning. <laughs> it's called a yeah, yeah, because we're caught in time. That is sin in the sine wave. It's all science. Uh, three, four, seven, twelve, and forty are indeed among the most sharply revelatory keys to the entire system of scriptural interpretation. It is ridiculous that Christian exegesis of its own book has for 16 centuries laboured at the interpretation with practically no regard for the meaning of these numbers. It will, be later, it will later be seen as a clear evidence of esoteric incompetence. It has remained for students outside the pale of Christian apologetics to interpret the Bible most capably and profoundly. Uh, <clears throat> what were the twelve disciples, if not men? In the esoteric understanding, they were the same in twelve aspects of the, of the three kings of wise men were in the threefold division. Or uh, they were the same three powers of spirit further subdivided into twelve aspects. They were just the spiritual power and intelligence, uh, which is the Christ itself, manifesting its wholeness in a 12-part segmentation, in the same way in which the atomic force of the universe manifests in a seven-part differentiation. So the spiritual nucleus of life manifests in a 12-fold unfoldment. Nature sounds a seven-key octave, and divine mind sounds a 12-key diapason. 
So divine mind has 12 keys. So mind, spirit, mind over matter. Matter is seven. That's why we have seven luminaries, seven Elohim or cosmocrators. You see, these, these seven, these Elohim, they've been called um, the Demiurge, the second creator, because they create physical things. And voila, here we are. Take one of the planets away and we disappear too. So they are the ones that through their, their orbits and their energies and their powers, they are the ones that are giving us shape and form and, and everything. There's not a thing that they don't give us. Okay, Al-Biruni, the, um, the Islamic astrologer of the 10th century. The various organs of a plant are distributed to different planets. Thus the stem of a tree is appropriated to the sun. The stem of a tree belongs to the sun. The roots to Saturn, the thorns, twigs and bark to Mars, the flowers to Venus, the fruit to Jupiter, the leaves to the moon and the seed to Mercury. They control everything. In fact, Mercury, the right brain, controls all of our senses. That's why Mercury, or Hermes, the Hermetica, uh, in the East they call Hermes uh, Buddha. The Romans called um, him Mercury. Well, he controls the five senses. That's why he's the messenger of the God. You know, when you touch something, you're getting a message, are you not? Well, that's Mercury. That's what the planets are doing. The planets are giving us, are bestowing us these gifts. Uh, <clears throat> even if the fruit of a plant, like a melon, even in the fruit of a plant, like a melon, the constituent parts are divided among several planets. The plant itself and the flesh of the fruit belong to the sun. It's moisture to the moon. It's rind to Saturn. Smell and colour to Venus. Taste to Jupiter. Seed to Mercury and the skin of the seed and its shape to Mars. It is rare that only one planet furnishes the indicators for one subject or object. Generally two or more are associated. As for example, when two elementary qualities are present, obviously related to two different planets. Thus the onion is related by its warmth to Mars and by its moisture to Venus. Uh, and opium by its coldness to Saturn and its dryness to Mercury. So when one, anyone speaks of Saturn as the significator of opium, it is merely its coldness that is referred to. And if Mercury is cited in the same capacity, it is due to its dryness. Right? Because there's cold and hot, dry and wet. They are the, the, uh, the virtues the active and the passive virtues of astrology. And each planet has two of those virtues. Right? So we can see how the planets, how the planets uh, are creators, how they are cosmocrators, uh, the Armonian artificers of Egypt that gouge out matter. They're always gouging out matter through space and making things, manifesting things. And, uh, of course, they are beneficent, but they are also tyrants, you see? Saturn, for instance, whatever is born in his kingdom must perish. Whatever is born in time, he's the boss of time. Will always be devoured by time. And in fact, that's, that's what um, the, um, the astrology and astrotheology is teaching us. It's teaching us that journey, how it works. The twelve labours that we are to perform, as Samson performed and the twelve disciples of Jesus, the twelve uh, sons of Israel, Israel meaning Isis, Ra and El, the ones that go around the wheel, the gospel. Now I want to get into uh, some, some of these beautiful, wonderful writers, okay? They've, they've done some amazing uh, works of art and I want to show you what's in their, these books. Here's a guy called Malik H. Jabbar and he's got uh, five, five or six books, I think. This one might be his sixth book. And this one is a series of five. And there's a picture of the books there. Um, if you go to uh, his website, this is how he uh, introduces his, his work. 
Welcome. This site provides information on the mythological origins of all universal religions. Religious scriptures are a registry of astronomical phenomena written in a mythological format. The evolution of our modern religious concepts began with astronomy and evolved through mythology and astrology into modern religion. Many of the Hebrew myth concepts are traceable to ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia. Jesus Christ, the Son, God, is a cosmic myth on par with Osiris, Horus, Samson, Adonis, Moses, Abraham, Solomon, Noah, Krishna, Mithra, Quetzalcoatl, and many other solar demigods. Evidence clearly shows that the Twelve Apostles are symbols of the zodiac sign and that Jesus Christ symbolised the sun, God, in, the sun, in some aspects a moon god. It is clear that the tales within the Bible are allegorical depictions of the interactions between elements of the cosmos. Religion exists at two levels, the esoteric and the, the exoteric and the esoteric, the inner and the outer. The inner religion is the one where you go within, and the outer one is the one, the book, the book religions, you know. Oh, read the watchtower and awake, then you'll be saved, you'll, you know. Uh, <laughs> they've all got their, their uh, publications and paraphernalia. That's the exoteric. The inner is already, you're already equipped with the inner one. That you've got forever. You're never denied that. Anywhere you go in the universe, you are never denied contact with source. Uh, so, you know, this exposes the foolishness of exoteric religion. Exoteric religion is, is an invention for uh, teaching the mechanics to children because that's, that's the way they, uh, they remember models and they remember and imprint images and symbols on their minds. But grown-ups are supposed to wake up. Yeah. The exoteric level, literal level of religious philosophy is pure idiocy. To think that the fantastic tales of demons and multi-headed monsters and miraculous events of every stripe, such as making the sun stand still, dividing the Red Sea, destroying the world by flood and all the other related nonsense, is accepted without hesitation on the basis of faith, is astonishing. Nevertheless, it is so. The esoteric level of religion is a science that is mathematical, coherent, logical and provable. Well, I've done it, beyond a doubt. <clears throat> but the science of truth is veiled by the mask of mythology. The science of truth is veiled by the mask of mythology. Some are repulsed by this mask and unfortunately turn away and denounce all concepts that support the possible existence of a creator God force. The great majority accepts the myth at face value, believe it or not. But fortunately there are some that choose the path of investigation of which you and I are a part. The purpose of these books is to explain the seminal relationship between astronomy, myth and modern religion. The books prove that ancient myth slash religion was in fact a written pictorial symbolic record of the celestial movements within the cosmos under the type of myth mythical deities. The history of the biblical Jesus Christ is drawn from the symbolical history of prior sun deities. His birth through to his death as represented in the Bible is a symbolical representation of the annual si sun cycle and other cycles at different levels of interpretation. Sounds great, doesn't it? Um, and I read that just so that you can get a taste of, of what this guy's thinking and how, how his, his books are just exquisite. I've learnt a lot from him, actually. I've learnt a lot about these cycles from reading his books. Uh, Malik H. Jabbar. And you can get, on, get them on Amazon. They're only about eight, eight bucks a piece. Uh, but some of the juicy things that he talks about, it's just amazing. Um, he understands that uh, Jacob, for instance, was the name uh, of the sun below the equator. And Israel, when he gets a name changed and he, and he um, wrestles with the angel and finally he conquers, he gets his name changed to Israel. Mm -hmm. Right? Abraham used to be Abram. Abram is the sun below the equator. At 90 years of age, 
90 degrees, he gets a name change to Abraham. You see, so uh, he's got all that stuff in there. It's just incredible. Um, I'd just like to read a little bit, really, some choice stuff from here. The gateways be, um, between the lower world and the upper world are the equinoxes. These are gateways. The vernal equinox is the gateway to the high hemisphere, equated with redemption. And the autumnal equinox is the gateway to the lower hemisphere, equated with suffering and death, according to the ancient symbolism. So when the sun falls below the equinox in the last part of the year and the earth approaches winter, the ancients saw that event as the imprisonment of the sun or the wounding of the sun, whereas its light was impeded and made ineffective. The imprisonment of Christ and the eventual crucifixion of him is symbolic of the span from the autumnal equinox to the sun's death at the winter solstice in the annual phase of the solar symbolism. Of course, biblically, the resurrection of Christ takes place proximate to the vernal equinox. This is because of the cultural input from the Hebrew Christians who wrote the biblical, biblical Christ myth. They fashioned the Christ after the sacrif sacrificial lamb of the post-Passover festival. See, when the sun finally passes over, they sacrifice the lamb, Ares, the Lamb of God. Uh, <clears throat> they also linked, oh sorry, they, the custom of the Jews to sacrifice uh, lambs or goats proximate to the equinoxes, both vernal and autumnal. You see the, the goat is, um, here's the, uh, the sheep and here's the goats in Capricorn. Cap, the sheep. See, Capricorn rules the, uh, the solstice and uh, Aries rules the equator. So this is in the book of Daniel where the, the he-goat and the ram are at loggerheads and they're always chasing each other, right? That's talking about this. That's the goat and that's the sheep. It's the solstices and the equinoxes. It's the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And I'll, I'll read that from another one of his books in a minute. Um, but I'll just finish here. The animal was the scape... Um, <clears throat> they also linked this, this sacrifice, killing of the animal, to the expiation of their sins. The animal was termed a scapegoat, a scapegoat that carried the load of punishment for the accumulated sins of the Jewish population. This is where the myth comes from that Jesus died for our sins, for the sins of the world. It is simply a copy of the old pagan superstitious customs of the Nord Normatic Hebrews. The Bible clearly calls Jesus the Passover, that he was a substitute for the Lamb of the Jews brought forth to human form under the Christian doctrine, which doctrine was composed of the early Christians who were actually Jews, members of a Jewish sect that later, over time, became distinct as Christians. The uh, Islamic religion, uh, early in its history, acknowledged astrology as, as a science, okay. officially. So uh, they had the, um, the courage to do that because Rome, on the other hand, was, was killing hermetists, Huguenots and Waldenses and Sicinians, etc. And in the Renaissance, you see, the Renaissance was founded on Hermes, the Prisca Theologia. Giordano Bruno was killed for saying, unless we go back to Hermes, that's why I'm devoting this to Giordano Bruno, because I, uh, like all these other guys, are continuing to further his work. Uh, and most of his work was de dealing with this and, and the fictional aspects of the Bible and teaching that the, there's only one religion slash science in the universe, and that's this, science. Yeah. This is it. This explains us, this describes us, this, this is what... We, we do, this is it, and there it is. Jesus is there, Peter is there, Jew Peter, Paul is there, Apollo, yeah. the sun, yeah. Mercury's there, Hermes, that's John, they're all there. Satan, Saturn, the characters are all there. This is what 
Everywhere you go in the universe where physical matter appears, there will be seven shining luminaries or orbs that will produce that. Will produce that. Yes. Yes. It's mind over matter. This nature sounds that that sound, according to, um, as he says, uh, nature sounds a seven key octave. Octave means eight, right? But you know, you always round these these. Uh, like you know, in music, you've, you've got your seven diatonic notes, but it's an octave, right? So you round off. We are an octave, or we are a septenary. Everything in our bodies is septenary. The seven chambers of the brain, seven chambers of the heart, the seven orifices in the body, the seven vital organs, etc., etc. Everything about our nature is septenary. Mm. It's a serpent. That's the serpent, and uh, the serpent is sitting sitting here. Um, a fucus is in the sign of Scorpio. <coughs> Let's have a look at Scorpio. Scorpio with the red, red star in it. Okay. Um, there is a fucus, the serpent bearer. So a fucus, what he does, he's carrying the serpent and the serpent's head is right next to the scales of Libra. You see, we, we saw that before, right? And the serpent is, is saying to the, the woman, and Booty, her husband, is, is Adam, this is Eve, Virgo, it's saying to her, eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This is the good, this is the evil. And the scales <coughs> are denoting that, because once the sun goes through these signs, it comes to a point where it has to flip over its polarity. It's given an electric summer, but now it has to change its nature. And it must flip that polarity and give, produce a winter. So it tastes from the tree of good and evil. Having tasted good, now it must have evil. And that's the serpent that is at the tree deceiving the woman because she eats from it first. Booties follows. So let's have a look at uh, the four horsemen, shall we, of the apocalypse. Uh, the white horse symbolizes the vernal equinox. The red horse symbolizes the autumnal equinox. The black horse, the winter solstice. That's where black satin is. And the pale horse, or green, symbolizes the summer solstice. You see, green and lush is that horseman of the apocalypse, that cardinal point. And as those, you see, the sun is always depicted, the sun is always depicted being transported around with four horses, okay? Four seasons, four horses, four uh, cardinal points. And, um, and as they go around, they have different natures and different qualities. Of course, the, uh, this, these are very similar, the equinoxes, right? Spring and autumn are very similar, but summer and winter, big difference. Okay. White is the colour of the good spirit, and in its mythical aspects, correlates astronomically to the vernal equinox. Red, the opposite or opponent counterpart of white in much of the symbolism and represents the autumnal equinox. Matter is counterbalanced by spirit, just as the autumnal equinox is counterbalanced by the vernal equinox. So the red horse is the autumnal equinox, the controller of the entrance into the infernal regions of the lower hemisphere. Black signifies the darkness of the pit of the lower world where the sun is shrouded by dark blackness. Green represents the verdant quality of the summer season brought in by the summer solstice. The Bible uses the term pale horse, but all of the biblical dictionaries define the term pale as synonymous to the color green. Now, the riders on the horses, they are different. The riders on the horses, one has a scale, that's Libra. And these are the riders of the horses, okay? Uh, the riders of the horses are distinct and separate from the horses in terms of their identity. One reason that other scholars over the years and centuries have failed to interpret this symbolism correctly is that they have blended the individual riders and their assigned horses into single entities, which is an error. The riders of the four horses are the zodiacal signs that pass over the stations 
of the horses, cardinal points. During the day, year or astrological era that may be targeted by the symbolism, the descriptions of the riders give us sufficient information for their identities. He that sat on the white horse had a bow and a crown, which indicates the sector of Sagittarius. Bow and a crown. Um, <clears throat> with the, the bow. Uh, the bow is um, Chaos Australis. That's the bow in the sector of Sagittarius. Um, and the crown is Corona Australis. Remember we spoke about Corona Borealis in uh, Libra, the crown of thorns? Well, this is Corona Australis of that sector. He that sat on the red horse is described as a killer and a disruptor of peace, which indicates the killer scorpion that carries the sting of death, whose venom ushers in the sorrow and misery of the winter season as the sun dips below the equinoxes into the sector of Scorpio. He that sat on the black horse carried balances in his hand, which of course is the scales of Libra. He that sat on the pale green horse was called Death and the governor of Hell, which is of course Saturn in Capricorn the well-known goat devil of the zodiac. And, of course, this corresponds with the dragon that drew a third part of the stars of heaven. Have you ever heard, heard of that in Revelation? And I saw the dragon and he hurled a third of God's stars from heaven. Right? Well, the constellation of Dra Draco uh, is in uh, Sagittarius, but it goes from goes from Virgo all the way down to Scorpio. That's exactly a third, 120 degrees of arc is occupied by Draco on the northern throne. It's a big constellation in the north. We can't see it, but it's up, up there where the, the Big Dipper is and all that. And Draco controls the North Pole. He gets about three stars to sit on the North Pole during the 24,000 year processional cycle. So he's basically the boss, right? And when Draco goes down, when Draco goes down, in other words, from Virgo downwards, this is the sign of betrayal, Virgo, the dragon hurls a third of God's angels down to the earth. We are told by these verses of the Bible that the dragon's tail drew a third of the stars of heaven this symbolism points directly to the zodiacal signs Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius and Capricorn which are situated right in the fold of the dragon's tail. I have explained conclusively in book four, he's got his five books here, that the dragon of the apocalyptic heavens of the Bible symbolizes the constellation Draconis uh, with the stellar symbolism. The tail of the biblical dragon of the heavens in the Bible is synonymous to the tail of the cosmic dragon, which is in fact the constellation Draconis. The constellation of Draconis stretches over nearly half of the sky's celestial longitude, and at the time of the uh, biblical editing, the tail of Draconis traversed the span of the zodiac stretching from the autumnal equinox through the winter solstice, a span of four zodiacal constellations, thus denoting the fall of the sun into the lower regions of the cosmos as demarcated by the celestial equator. Now, the concept <coughs> of the stars telling the true story in the sky, the uh, gospel, is not um, foreign to the Christians. Um, here are some books that were written by, basically by churchgoers, right? I'm talking uh, Joseph Cease. This guy is quoted a lot. I mean, he wrote this book in 18... Uh, or late 1800s, I'm pretty sure. <clears throat> and um, the Gospel in the Stars. Now, <clears throat> interesting thing about all these books I'm going to show you, written by pretty much churchgoers, who are trying to... <clears throat> because, because they cannot deny the astrotheology, it's there. It's in the Bible. It's right there. You know, Jesus has 12, Jacob has 12... I mean, here's a, here's a passage in Revelation. 
Revelations 21, 12 to 14, uh, says, uh, talking about holy Jerusalem, it says, it had a wall great and high and had 12 gates. And at the 12 gates, 12 angels and the names w written thereon, <clears throat> which are the names of the 12 tribes of Israel, the children of Israel. On the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. and the west, three gates. <clears throat> And the wall of the city had 12 foundations. That's the city. <clears throat> and, in them, the, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb, the ruler of them all, the Lamb, because the Son is always called the Lamb. Or it is called the fisher of men, the rock, the twin, the scapegoat of Israel, the lion of the tribe of Israel, Aquarius, the son of man. So, <clears throat> can't deny it. So what they do is then they sort of uh, reclaim the story. And, uh, but the thing is, they've, they've all pretty much failed to understand the way it goes. Because they all start, <clears throat> all of these, they all start with the sign of Virgo. Assuming that Virgo, as I told you before, the story about if a fucus and, and serpents and serpents kaput the head of the serpent is right there next to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and there he is seducing the woman to eat from the, tr the, the fruit. Well, they, they've assumed that the Garden of Eden was here, you see, and then the fall, and we've fallen. And so they've gone around, they've gone around this way, around the gospel, and um, <clears throat> Francis Rolleston did the same thing, contemporary. Uh, Here's one, God's voice in the stars, zodiac signs and Bible truth. Hmm. This one's called Gospel in the Stars and this one's called Maseroth, Job 38:32. Uh, Canst thou tell Maseroth? God says to Job, he says, can you, uh, you know, do you know the Maseroth, the zodiac? Why would God be asking anyone that? when the Bible says that astrology is from the devil? Hmm. Well, because <clears throat> when you know, when you know the wheel and how it pans out with Adam Kadmon, the man in the sky, you see, we are made in the image of God. Right? The Elohim, they say, uh, let us make man in our image. That's the image. 48 constellations. 48 constellations go in your body. The ecliptic runs straight through the centre. Aries in the head, Pisces in the feet. The two hands, arms, are the twins. <clears throat> there they are. And their deacons are also parts of organs of the body. You know, I mean, there's 36 extra zodiacal signs which make th uh, we, uh, the 360 uh, acupuncture points, basically, of um, acupuncture or 360 degrees of a, a circle. It, it, has to do, it has to do with, these are holy numbers, they're sacred numbers because they are star numbers. That's why you go to a minna star. I mean, it's not only in religion, uh, <clears throat> it's not only in religion that this stuff is going on. I mean, let's have a look at something, shall we? When you get your master's degree, see, in the secular world, this is the religious world, and this is how, you know, the buffoons are trying to hide their, uh, <laughs> their astro-theology. I mean, please, uh, you know, you've got Cardinal, Deacon, Sexton, Moon, uh, you've got all this star stuff in there, Elder. Um, so, what happens when you are a master? Well, you are able to uh, measure the stars. That's what you are. You're a measurer of the stars by degrees, 360 degrees. So you go to university, right, and you study and you learn, and then at the end they tell you that you are a measurer of the stars. Not at the start. That's how you get your degrees. We've got to get our degrees. That's why God says to Job, can you tell the Maserat? Because if you don't, you're a fool like the rest, like the herd. And that's why this story, this gospel must be told. Because in the gospel, 
is the, uh, the story of the conquering of the sun. It is the story of how the sun um, continues in his journey to return to bring us beautiful fruits and seasons and, and just wonderful things, you know. And he's always there and we, we copy him. We copy the sun. As the sun goes around and gets born in our head every morning at six o'clock, that would be where you do your thinking, wouldn't it? So is it better if you get up at six? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Uh, who knows? Yeah. yeah. You know, the, the, the rhythms, we, it's always better when you get up with the birds. They say that. It's, and it's always good to be sleeping from, say, ten yeah. <clears throat> to six in the morning. And that's, where, and that's where there are no vital organs. That's eight hours of sleep that you would normally need. You see, but whereas when the sun wakes up, so do you, in the head, thinking. And then Taurus is eating the mouth <clears throat> and speaking. Thinking, Aries. Speaking, Taurus. Doing, Gemini. That's you build your house with a, with a hammer in one hand and a saw in another. Right? So when you want to do something, first you think it, then you speak it, then you do it. And that's the Father and the Son, the Logos, the Word. You see, if you don't speak what you're going to think about, doing, it never gets done. For instance, <clears throat> if you want to build a house. Hmm, two storeys or one storey, single storey? Uh, brick or timber? You know, first you think about it, right? And then you talk about it, right? You tell your family and you tell perhaps the, uh, the local council. They might want to see some plans, so you have to talk to them. You might need to talk to some contractors, that'd be handy. Concreters, they come in handy. Uh, <laughs> so you're speaking now, right? That's the speaking stage, the word. And then you put a hammer in hand and you go away and you do. And that is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The noose, the Logos and the Nevma. Because Mercury, I mean uh, Gemini, uh, also rules the two lungs, which is the Nevma, the spirit. Nevma. The noose, the Logos and the Nevma, the spirit, the air. And the spirit is always being considered to be the creative factor behind the material universe. And God sent forth his Holy Spirit and he created the, the upper waters and the lower waters, right? Because that's the spirit, the doing. Back to this. <laughs> uh, hi the hieroglyphs of the heavens. This is a very ancient book. <laughs> the hieroglyphs of the heavens. Ancient, I mean, you know, a good 150 at least years. Uh, so I'm talking, these people knew, knew this. Um, but they were all reclaiming the story of the gospel for Christianity because you can't hide it. But they all, interestingly enough, start their gospels from here. Whereas the, the Gospels truly start from Aries and Capricorn. Matthew and Luke start here with the nativity scene. And Mark, as I've just shown already, and John begin with, see the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Because as we've already read, this was dealing with death and sin and, 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 and awful things. Whereas now the Son has, you know, returned and repented. Um, so you've got that. Uh, this is an interesting one, The Witness of the Stars by E. W. Bullinger. Uh, God's Voice in the Stars, Kenneth Fleming. Peter Le Miserier wrote one. Uh, now, I'm a big fan of this guy because he wrote about the, uh, the Great Pyramid. Uh, and he's, he's got a lot of great literature and um, this I don't think is one of them. <laughs> Because, well, it is and it isn't. Because, I mean, it's wrong. <laughs> the gospel does not start in Virgo, you know. Uh, it starts in Aries. Um, you can start it anywhere, really, uh, if, if you want to. You can start it anywhere. The, the, in fact, you can. Because the, it's, a, it's, a, it's a point that defines beginnings wherever it's at. Because it's never, it never ends. So you can begin your life in Taurus and be a Taurian fixed with those qualities, and you will be. Because <laughs> as, the, as the sun and the planets go and, and produce all these different uh, configurations in the skies, so are there energies that are being reflected back to us along this line of the sin wave as it is imprinting its 
mind forces into matter, our matter, and imprints in us the electric and magnetic polarities that we will have for every part of our bodies. The liver, ruled by Mars, hot and fiery. Uh, the, the lungs, ruled by the moon. The brain, the right hemisphere, Mercury. The left hemisphere, the masculine, is Mars. You know, the, the planets have rulership of everything in your body. Well, you can deny that if you think it's from the devil. Well, go ahead and deny it. And then you will never understand the science and what it means to have Mars in your liver or the, or the sun in your liver. Or to, or to give thanks for the, the, the tasty fruits that uh, are given to us by Jupiter. Because that's what Jupiter does. Al-Biruni explained that everything's sweet. We give grace to Jupiter. That's Jove. By Jove. You know? Yeah, Sagittarius, the ruler of the happy ones. Wherever Jove rules, Pisces and Jupiter, these guys, they get that jovial, Jupiterian, magnanimous, graceful uh, spirit because um, he's the benefactor. He's the greater benefic. Venus is the lesser benefic. So Venus is always there, all right? We're going to see these characters. I'm going to show you some amazing things. So Peter Le Miserie, uh, the procession of the ages, he called that. The gospel of the stars, celebration of the mystery of the zodiac. Guys, this is pretty incredible stuff. Uh, it, you know, when you really think about this, that Christianity or the churches have tried to reclaim this, this gospel. There's only one. There's, this is the hermetic one. This is Hermes, pure Prisca Theologia, you're getting here. This is ripped straight from Egypt. This is how it was made, the science. It, it, it shall never change. Regardless of the procession of the equinoxes and the fact that the, the powerful equ equinoxes here... And in fact, this is how, this is how powerful these uh, cardinal points are, that they have named the equinoxes to be the point in which... Um, in which the sun, when the sun is at this point, the sign behind it is the sign of the age we're in. In other words, on March the 21st, every year, when you watch the sun rising, right, you find what is the planet behind that? That's the age we're in. So for 2,000 years, the sun has been, be, uh, the, uh, Pisces has been behind the sun for 2,000 years. At this point, the equator. That's how important they are, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. What I'm going to do now is share with you some interesting facts, okay? Just some little tidbits about, um, about this science to show that this was once upon a time a world religion slash science, right? Before patriarchy came in and the theocratic types, right? They are the ones that pushed aside the deists, the people who are worshipping the creator through this science. The theocrats come along and they say, uh, God is like this and God is like that. And he's an interventionalist. You know, he just uh, jumps in every now and then and says, oh, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah now because they're naughty. Uh, so I'll, in I'll intervene in, in man's affairs, uh, you know. Well, see, that's the kind of God that they paint, the theocratics, because what their intention is, is to dominate and enslave mankind with, a, with an idol. You see, Jesus never was a man. What benefit is it anyway if he was a man? If, if he was and he said those beautiful things, great, because those things in the Bible are beautiful. The science behind them is beautiful. When you work it out, it's all about the transmutation. But the, the fact that Rome did this is the fact that they've gone after this knowledge and persecuted, persecuted it and uh, given us a, some sort of a historical tradition whereby they can go and meddle in your affairs. In fact, they can call an inquisition if they like. And Rome did do that. The pages of history are bloodied with their deeds how they used Christianity to uh, bring people into the Inquisition, like Giordano Bruno. For seven years, uh, they had him in Rome, and they couldn't get him. But finally, they got him on a little technicality that, you know, he belongs to the devil, surely. He's telling the world that we've got to go back to Hermes. He's telling everybody about the Prisca theology here. 
and that all the, the universe is populated with beings and that the Bible is not a literal document, let's get him out of the way. Right, the Inquisition? Uh, on the day of his death, they um, pulled his tongue out and tied it to something and uh, stretched it out so he couldn't talk to the people that were present in the Piazza dei Fiori. Uh, still today, on the 17th of February, mark this date, people, and remember it, because the voice of Giordano Bruno, they killed him, but his voice has come back and it's going to destroy the fictions. And I, I hope to be a part of that. But I know Gerald Massey, uh, Godfrey Higgins, Alvin Boyd Kuhn, Manly P. Hall, they've already done a great job. Uh, but on 17th of February, 1600, uh, and they stripped him naked and burned him slowly for uh, teaching these things. You see, so the uh, interventionalist God that they've created and of course you can get the uh, Mormon brand, you can get the Pentecostal brand, uh, the buffoon brand, there's a bunch of them. They've all got their patented brand of, um, of uh, fiction. Um, so, but what they've done in effect is they have created an idol. Because there's no salvation without, it's within. The Christ is within. Uh, the Christ has always been within. And um, that is the one bearing witness. You see the Kabbalistic tree, the seven chakras, the spiritual organism. It's been there. And you can see there Jesus in the background. That's the one bearing witness. That's the soul in man. Here's some interesting facts, though, that show this, um, this unified thought process that we once had before the theocrats came along. Okay? Ra, the Aborigines in Australia, there's a tribe that call the sun Ra, like the Egyptians. And there's the Apaches, the Apaches, the Apache Indians. Ra. Uh, the Elohim, if you go to Hawaii, they greet you with Aloha. Elohim. In uh, Turkey, they greet you with Merkaba. Male, uh, a female male vessel. That's the Merkaba, the, the, uh, the star tetrahedron in your body, the star of David. Okay? That one in a, a star, two of them. Okay? The tetrahedron. Tetra meaning four. Um, Kabbalah. Same thing. Okay? And this is an Egyptian word. But they greet you in Turkey. They say, Merhaba, like that, right? Uh, the Hopi word for the sun is the Tibetan word for the moon and vice versa. Because they're opposite each other. That's what the Hopi Indians say. They know that. They know that in Tibet, their sun is the moon and the moon is the sun. Respective words. Revelation 11.8 says that Jesus Christ was crucified in Egypt. Egypt? No, he wasn't. He was crucified in Jerusalem. No, Rev uh, Revelation 11.8 says that he was crucified in Egypt. Well, this is Egypt. Everything below the kidneys, according to the occultists, was called Egypt. It's red. It's infrared. See, the bottom chakra is red. It's infrared. It's infernal. Whereas the indigo chakra is ultraviolet, or the violet chakra. Ultraviolet, yeah? That's where the love is. And that's where the higher dimensions are in which we will live. There are chakras, there's eight chakras, an octave of chakras above our heads. And that's the astral world where we go. And in the fourth one above the head, we reunite with our soulmates. Okay, um, in order to understand that, there's a book here, a, a chapter in this book. This is probably the, the biggest consciousness expander that you will ever, ever bump into on the planet. This is all about this. That's where I got it from. Thomas H. Burgoyne. The light of Egypt and the science of the soul and the stars. As above, so below. By the way, that octave is where we're going next. It's an invisible life. This is visible only because our eyes tell us that it's visible. But it's all this that we see, anything, is all just motion. Okay? So as we go up, 
there's an octave of eight above our heads, and there's eight octaves to reach cause. That's where we're headed. That's the gate back. As the Jews call it, as we descend down, down the word, uh, the, the worlds, there's the Adam Kadmon and the, eman the four emanations of Kabbalah. You have uh, Atz Atz Atzula, you have um, Beriah, you have Yetzirah and Asiah, the four worlds. And as you climb down Jacob's ladder, there's 125 steps. And then you've got another 125 to go back up. Where are we? Well, that's up to us. It's up to our, our decisions and how we live our lives. But um, that's why Jesus was crucified in Egypt, because he gets crucified there on the 21st of December. On the solstice, <clears throat> there was a... Uh, there was, it's interesting because that's where, where Jesus gets crucified, but he also is born on the 25th of December, right? Well, there was a guy called Cyprian who said, um, Oh, how wonderfully acted, acted providence that on the day on which the Son was born, Christ should be born. <laughs> you know? Uh, but then you get the Jehovah's Witnesses who say, yeah, but the Bible doesn't say he was born on the 25th, so, and no one knows when he was born. Yes, that's right. But the point is, when you, <laughs> when you apply all of the, the Christian theology and all of their conceived notions and ideas and, and put it onto that, then you get the origin of it. It's, it's there. Um, <clears throat> you see, and look, when, when, you, when you draw this circle and, and, and you put the cardinal points in, that's actually the sign... That's the glyph in astrology for the earth, right? That, there it is, that's the earth. The sun is that. That dot and the sign of multiplication and addition and the sign of division and subtraction, right? They're all in there. This is Earth, as I've already said, because it, it's, it adds. Uh, where did your bodies come from? The womb of your, your mother. Because the mother is the matter. The father provides a little egg called a sperm. That's invisible. That's the spirit. But once they meet in the womb and they, um, the two eggs un unite, um, then they double and then quadruple, and then they make the star of David, tetrahedron, star tetrahedron, and then they, and I, and I think that's the last division um, before, before it um, just, all, those original eight cells, according to Drumbolo Melchizedek, uh, those original eight are in the, the centre of our body and are the original cells that we, we kept from our mother's womb and they make the star tetrahedron. The Merkaba has its centre in there and that's what's causing our Merkaba, Merkaba spin, right? Um, but the earth sign is feminine and it adds. This is water and it multiplies. Water is generation, Scorpio, the generative area, the moon. Um, and the male signs dividing or subtracting and division. And that's the sun, the dot. All these, all these express the, um, the signs of what we're up against. Now, to understand uh, that better, all of this, uh, Alvin Boyd Kuhn, the esoteric structure of the alphabet, and it talks about this. Uh, let me press forward. Now, a lot of people say, oh, but this is only in English. Can't do it in Italian. Oh, yes, you can. I can do it, because I speak Italian. There's, there's more connections in Italian, but that you just lose all the, all the thing. But I've already mentioned the word bello. It comes from el, bale. Because if you're as good-looking as bale, the sun in his splendor, of course you're bello. 
And the Spanish article for um, the male article, uh, definite article, uh, el. And in Italian it's il. In French it's le. Right? It's the same thing. It's el, it's the sun. And la, like would be in French, Italian and Spanish, is la. Uh, that would be luna. Yeah. That's what the Elohim mean. El is masculine, Eloha is feminine, and the M is plural. Male, feminine gods. Saturn is a boy, Jupiter is a boy, Mars, a boy, the sun. They're all the top, top boys. All right? And the feminine ones are below in the, in the uh, uh, sub-solar world. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Let's have a look at some characters that turn up in the, um, in the Gospels, right? When the sun comes through Libra and gets judged, we've already discussed that. Um, and, uh, and so the betrayal happens, okay? That's the same as um, Delilah betraying Samson. Del Delilah means the door uh, to darkness. Uh, Layla meaning the night, I think. Yeah, the night. So Delilah is like door to the darkness because she's always there. <laughs> At, she rules four to six every day. So she's the door to the darkness. She betrays the sun because she says, Whit. you're going to go down. <laughs> you're going to get judged by the Philistines. She, she betrays Samson. Of course, Samson has seven rays, you know, seven locks of hair and they cut his seven. Again, the number seven keeps turning up. Interesting, no? Because the sun is the seven-rayed god according to Proclus. And that's what they always called him, the seven-rayed God, because he has his seven helpers, doesn't he? So Jesus gets betrayed by Judas Iscariot, okay? The, the sign of Scorpio looks like this. Uh, what would that be in the alphabet? J. Yeah, beautiful. Judas Iscariot. So when the sun, when the sun, and Antares, the red one, is right here, Okay? I've pointed that out. When the sun goes down below here, and, and it's like Adam and Eve ate from the tree of good of knowledge, so God gave them garments, right? Well, that's what you do when you go down to winter. You need garments, otherwise you freeze. Um, <clears throat> so, but Jesus, he gets betrayed by Jay, Scorpio. Scorpio, the November month. That's the, that's the betrayer of the sun. He's always ready to grab the sun and bite him, backbite him, as the sun falls in the fall months. And um, he does that with the kiss, the kiss of... Uh, 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 ...betrayal. Because when a, a backbiter, which was a Scorpio, a scorpion, uh, bites, it leaves, it leaves this mark. So that's why Judas betrays the sun with a kiss in the Garden of Gethsemane. Sagittarius. Now, who's in Sagittarius? Well, Draco, Draconis. Right? That's the devil, the dragon. The dragon is here, that's the devil. So in the Garden of Gethsemane, remember Jesus was being tempted, there was the devil there. And what about Peter? He cut off the, um, the high priest Malchus's ear, remember? Malchus, the high priest servant was there, uh, the servant of the high priest. Peter grabs a sword and cuts it off and then Jesus grabs it and sticks it back on again. Well, Malchus means the king, right? Uh, so Malchus is, is Mal, remember what I said about El, Al, El, all of that in the, in the Jewish works. We're talking about the sun. So the arrow of Sagittarius, which is Sagittarius is ruled by Jupiter. That's where the Apostle Peter comes in. All the characters are there. There's the Garden of Gethsemane. Draco, the devil. Peter with his sword, who cuts off the ear. This would be considered an ear. Cuts off the ear of, the, of Malchus. Malchus is the king. In the Garden of Gethsemane, after Judas betrayed the sun for 30 pieces of silver. 30 pieces of silver. That's the moon, the moon's silver, because it takes 30 days to traverse 
a sign, right? Yeah. The sun. Because 30 pieces of silver are worth about 13 cents. Yeah. Check it out. Yeah. It was worth nothing. So, you see, these are not physical events. These are events in the sky, the gospel. Um, have a look at this picture here. The Vesica Pisces. <clears throat> There's the Virgin Mary. Remember the two eggs that unite? That is the vagina. Okay, that's why Mary looks like that. Yep. Take note. Look carefully. Yep. And, 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 yeah, and she, yeah, and she is in the Vesica Pisces because this is where the, the soul comes into the world. Because when those two eggs unite, they make one egg right, in the womb, and then they divide. Mm -hmm. But as they divide, the soul uh, is supposedly, or, or the spirit is, is in there. And that's what it's, the Vesica Pisces is teaching. See the 12 stars yeah. around the virgin's head? That's the 12 stars. And um, there they are, the Alpha and the Omega, the seven vowels, A, E, E, I, O, O, U. That's the Om, the Amun, the Amen. Um, the Alpha is, there's the Greek word for Selini. There's uh, Irmis, Mercury, Hermes, there's Hermes. Er, Hermes, or Irmis, the swift of feet, Quicksilver. Mercury's fast, right? Because he's near the sun in just 88 days. Whizzing around, all right. But there's a Selene. Anything with a Lini, like Jerusalem or Helen of Troy or Magdalene, it's the moon. Uh, Selene, what have we got here? Venus, Aphrodite. And here we've got the I, the letter I. Remember, yes, I E S, the sun, yes, that's his sound. Ilios or uh, Elios, there it is, that's an E, that's an E in Greek. Aris, Mars, the keen of sword. Uh, Zeus, Jupiter, the blazing eyes of wide seeing. And Chronos, Saturn, the white hair of Hori. This is the description that the Apostle John sees in Revelation, he, and he, he actually describes the seven planets. He describes them. The cosmocrators in the first chapter of Revelation. And he sees, some, he sees the, the, wa the wave murmuring voice of Selene, the moon. The swift feet of Mercury. The belt around the paps of Aphrodite. The shining face of the sun, Helios. The sword of Aris. The blazing eyes of Zeus and the white hair of Ori, that's Kronos. He's the old man and he's the, uh, the wicked stepbrother step of Jesus that rules the underworld, you see. He's a very, he's not the Messiah, he's a very naughty boy. <laughs> and, uh, and if you get a chance, if you haven't seen The Life of Brian, watch it, <laughs> and watch it and remember what I'm teaching you here, please. Uh, because it makes a mockery of the uh, theocratic system. Uh, the, you know, John Cleese and all those guys, and, and Terry and uh, Michael, sure yeah, they, they are historians. Mm -hmm. They knew the hocus pocus that was going on in the churches and how ridiculous it was. Let's go to a stoning, shall we? You know, all of that stuff. Yeah. It's ridiculous. And that's what uh, this is exposing. Let's have a look at some astrotheology from volume two of Thomas Burgoyne's Light of Egypt. Volume one is the one that I say is got to be read if you want to deepen your knowledge further than this. If you really want to further your knowledge beyond what I'm teaching you, I would really go with volume one, vol volume two. Look at the exquisite stuff that comes out of this. Astrotheology. There is one species of divine revelation which has not and cannot be tampered with, one great Bible which forms the starry original of all Bibles. This sacred Bible 
is the great astral Bible of the skies. Its chapters are the twelve great signs. Its pages are the innumerable glittering constellations of the heavenly vault. And its characters are the personified ideals of the radiant sun, the silvery moon, the shining planets of our solar sphere. The simple story of creation begins at midnight when the sun has reached the lowest point in the arc Capricorn. Interesting. The story, what he's saying is exactly what you just heard, that the story starts here. Well, as I said, Matthew and uh, Luke do start here with the nativity. All nature then is in a state of coma in the northern hemisphere. It is winter time. Solar light and heat are at the lowest ebb and the various, uh, various appearances of motion, etc., are the sun's passage from Capricorn to Pisces, 60 degrees. And from Pisces to Aries, 30 degrees, marking 90 degrees or one quadrant of the circle. Then begin, in real earnest, the creative powers. It is springtime. The six days are the six signs of the northern arc. That's the northern arc. That's what's called the northern arc. That's the Jewish menorah. The sun's always at the top, moon, Mercury, no, sorry, moon, Mars, well anyway, it goes like this, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Saturn's always over here, the moon's over here, the alpha and the omega, remember the moon is the alpha and Saturn, the very naughty boy, is the omega, he's the end because he's got the scythe and he's the end of the cycle. As you come in through the moon, alpha, you go back through the omega and he's got the scythe to do the, uh, the cropping, <laughs> the harvesting of souls. The six days are the six signs of the northern arc, beginning with the disruptive Aries, then in their order, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, then Libra, the seventh day and the seventh sign, whose first point is opposite Aries, and is, quite, and is the opposite point of the sphere, the point of equilibrium. Equal day and equal night. It is autumn. It is the sixth sign from Aries, the first creative action. And so the sixth day following the fiery force, wherein God created the bisexual man. See Genesis 1, 5 to 27. So God created them in his own image. In the image of God created he then. A him, male and female, he created them. It is the seventh or the day of the Lord, man, the climax of material creation and Lord of all living things, and he rests in the blissful garden of Eden, the seventh day, and the seventh sign is the concealed sacred Libra, the perfect union of the senses. Um, then comes the fall from Libra through Scorpio and banishment from the garden of Eden, because this is the garden of Eden. This is banishment from the garden of Eden. Um, it is the story of Satan, or winter over summer, etc. It is useless to repeat the same old story, same old, old story. <laughs> Put two olds in there. Uh, the yearly journey of the sun around the constellated dial of deity is the astro basis of all primitive cosmology. Hermes Trismegistus. If you want to see the origin of the Gospels, read this. Okay, this is the uh, divine Pymanda. Pymanda is the mind of God. It's the space. Right? That's the mind over the matter. Pymanda, and this is, um, look, I can read portions of this, and you will, you will see, uh, here we go. Verse 5, out of the light, holy word Logos descended on that nature. Hmm, interesting. That's what we spoke about Logos, didn't we? It's the sun. It descended. The holy word, light, Logos, descended on the nature. That light, he said, I am thy God. Mind, prior to moist nature, which appeared from darkness. The light world, Logos, that appeared from mind, is son of God. This is... This is um, Incredible how many similarities there are here to, in, in here to the Gospels. 
just another point on the languages. I, I was mentioning that about um, Italian and French and everything like that. It's interesting. The son here is called Horus. He's the boy. Osiris, Horus, Ra, the radiating sun, right? Ra, radiate. Uh, and then here it's called Set because the sun sets. Yeah, and, and Set is the enemy of... The, these are the two warring brothers, right? Horus and Set, Jesus and Satan. Set is Satan. And in fact, uh, Satan exalts in Libra. So Horus exalts here, but Sa Satan, Set exalts here because it punishes the sun right, and brings in the magnetic part of the year. This is all physics. <laughs> you put your physics hat on when you're, when, you're, when you're looking at this. Well, the Italians say um, hour. That's the word for hour, right? The Italians say um, ora. Does that look like oris to you? The French say er. <laughs> the Greeks say order. This is all, I mean, you can choose any language and do this. The, the words are there. They are still there. I mentioned this book before, uh, The Biography of Satan. And this is Kersey Graves, okay? Dealing with astrotheology uh, over uh, 130 years ago. Here's what he said on, um, in chapter 7 of this book. Winter was, with her cold, bleak drapery and her widespread desolation and destruction, in the estimation or imagination of the ancients, the principal and most prolific source of evil, i.e. the god of winter. That was the most prolific source of evil. Right there, people. This is, this, and this is how it works. You're going to see this is beautiful. The principal inhabitants of the earth, as uh, heretofore intimated, have, having noticed that during six months of the year, the powers at work in nature in, are engaged in fructifying, vivifying, beautifying, producing, etc. And that during the other six months, some apparently adverse power arrested, blasted, and destroyed those desirable operations in, and their results, they hence imagined two contrary hostile powers engaged in perpetual war against each other. And as the six spring and summer months were attended with almost perpetual sun, sunshine and the growth and, produ and production of fruits and flowers and culinary or edible vegetables, things that were calculated to supply their natural wants. They were regarded as constituting and became known as the true kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, summer. While the winter months were denominated the kingdom of darkness, winter. The former was also called the kingdom of the sun, or God who dwelt in the sun, this imagery uh, entrance to the kingdom, this imaginary entrance to the kingdom, which it was supposed opened to the sun as he left the Tropic of Cancer to travel back to the south, was called the Gates of Heaven. While the fancied passage through the other tropics constituted the Gates of Hell. At the first stood the Lamb the zodiacal sign of spring, to usher in the glorious sun or sun god. As he drove up with his fiery steeds, remember the horseman, drives up with the fiery steeds to the portals of paradise in early spring. At the latter stood the hideous scorpion, scorpion dragon or devil, ready to drag everything accessible to his clutches or power. Down into the, his bottomless pit at one time, hitching his tail over and pulling down one third of the stars. Remember, the, dra the dragon is here and he pulls down a third of the stars. That's a third from here to here. Hence you will discover that the devil is from above and not from below. Though he descends below every six months into Hades, as hereafter explained, 
You will find, by consulting your almanacs, that Aries, the lamb or ram, is the zodiacal or astronomical sign for March and the first spring month. And the first spring month. And the scorpion was, through the eagle, uh, though the eagle is now, the sign of October, the first winter month, in the bisectional division of the year. That is, by dividing the year into two seasons of six months each. St. John speaks of the dragon having power to hurt the five months. And astronomically speaking, he does hurt the vegetable production of the five principal prolific months of the year with a vengeance. They are the five months, these from here, from Scorpion to Pisces. That's the five months that, that um, um, the dragon has power to hurt in Revelation. And St. John's monster with the seven heads and ten horns may find a solution in astronomy or astrotheology by assuming the seven heads to be the seven summer months. As some nations divided the year in this way and duplicating the five winter months for the horns and then the story of the dragon pursuing again you see the seven summer months the seven uh, white notes of the piano and the five black notes of the piano there's always this seven five going on okay how easy it is to imagine then by observing in the almanac that the dragon or scorpion the same thing is the next sign after the Virgin. There's the dragon and um, the next sign, Libra was always considered um, to be, uh, the Virgin was always considered to occupy this, the whole of this space and um, then they, they put this in here. So the dragon is always, he's the red dragon because there's a red star there, he's always following the Virgin. And it may be more than fancy to associate the woman and the serpent here with the scene in Eden where a serpent is represented as tempting a woman, Mother Eve, to masticate a pippin with her new incisors and molars which never had been used. He's being sarcastic here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and as we find a man also Aquarius among the signs of the zodiac, this may be Father Adam. For it is more agreeable, not to say honourable, to fancy or conceive of our first parents being formed among the stars than in a mud hole, according as the Lord said unto Moses. The prophet Daniel speaks of a great contest between a ram and a goat. Remember the contest between the ram, uh, sorry, uh, the ram and the goat. The goat rules the solstice, the lamb rules the equinox. Both of these you will find represented in your zodiac and apparently chasing each other through the heavens. Again, St. John's marvellous figure of a woman clothed with the sun. Remember the woman clothed with the sun? There's the sun in the back of her head and the moon at her feet and a crown of 12 stars upon her head. Easily understood, it is easily understood when viewed through the astronomical mirror. More appropriately, may the astronomical virgin woman be said to be clothed with the sun than could be said of any other twelve of the other twelve signs of the zodiac. Judging from her situation among the signs and her relative position to the sun, there she stands right in the focus of the sun's rays in August, the hottest month of the year and thus is clothed with the sun more brilliantly than that of any other sign. Of course, of course the virgin is clothed with the sun. And in here he talks about how the woman is being chased by the dragon and he follows her into the wilderness. You see when the dragon, when Virgo goes down below the horizon, anything below the horizon is the wilderness, right? When, when the sun sets, it's gone down into the wilderness. That's what the astrologers um, used to say. So he follows her into the wilderness, right? And then it says that he gouges out a river from his mouth to swallow the woman. Well, what's coming up 
is Eridanus. Eridanus runs from Aquarius, opposite Leo, right? Eridanus. You'll see it in the sign of uh, Taurus, from the feet of Orion, and from 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 Aquarius comes the river, so, and that's the river in the sky. In Revelation, Jesus has 12 stars in his right hand, 12 congregations that are in Asia. Uh, sorry, uh, seven. Seven stars in his hand and the seven stars that are in Asia. Now, when you, um, when you, follow, when you follow those, um, those stars, the first one, the first congregation is in, it, well, they're all in Asia Minor. Now, Asia Minor is like modern-day Turkey, so it goes out like this. And, um, of course, they reckon Troy was here somewhere. But you've got um, the cities going from Ephesus to uh, Laodicea actually form an arch, right? And it's this arch here. This is Ephesus and this is Laodicea. Now, this is explained by the Reverend Robert Taylor in the year 1830. He went to jail. He went to jail for um, teaching this stuff. And we, um, you know, I, I, I can't say enough. I learnt so much from this book. This is the best astrotheology that you will get. He has deciphered them all, all of them. Um, and I've, I've done portions of this in some of my other videos. I've done the... Um, the Gospel of uh, Luke showing how um, uh, the Virgin visiting Elizabeth and, um, and all of that stuff having to do with the Gospel of Luke and the very first chapters um, is explained in the stars. First city is Ephesus. That's the word for Jesus, Jesus. Ephesus from F. Ephesus, it's, the writing is very small here, uh, upon, upon Jesus, no, it's all right. Um, the same as Jesus, uh, the Gaelish name of the god Mars, whence our English name for March, who is the Lord of hosts of the Old Testament, the Lamb of Gad. So Jesus is also Mars. Because this is Ephesus. This is the congregation in Asia that is Ephesus, Ares, Jesus, as in his role as Mars. Mars, who rules the sign of Ares. <clears throat> now, the second church is Thy Thyatira. And it means... Um, I tread on frankincense. Frankincense being offered to the sun when in the constellation of the bull of April. This is when you give sacrifice of frankincense to the sun. And so that's the second congregation, Thyatira. Okay? Um, <clears throat> famous for its patience, its labour and its work in the business of agriculture. Guess what this city is called? We've got Ephesus, Thyatira, frankincense. This one's called Philadelphia. Love of brothers, brotherly love. The third sign and the third city that is in Asia. This is the sort of, this is the sort of, sort of stuff that is in this book. It is rich, absolutely rich. And it says, uh, Philadelphia, brotherly, Philadelphia, brotherly love, the unequivocal characteristic of the two loving brothers, the twins of May. Pergamos, the fourth congregation that is in Asia. Height, elevation, marriage of fire. The sun's point of elevation is in the con this constellation. which dwelleth where Satan's seat is. Um, the hydra's head, uh, being as you see on the celestial globe, immediately under the, this church, which is Cancer, the crab of June, whose name is Thomas, who in the gospel allegory 
was but a crabbed sort of fellow and half a mind to go back again. Because the crab has to go back again. Right? So um, this is the um, Pergamos, the height. The Pergamos means the height, the elevation. Um, the fifth congregation that is in Asia is Sardis. Sardis means the rock, the stone or pillar. And dis means God. So, and, so afterward passing into the Coptic or ancient Phoenician word Elion. Right? So Sardis in the Phoenician is Elion, the sun. El and on means the being. Um, and in French and English became the word lion. Lion. So Sardis means lion. Right? Uh, Smyrna, the sixth. Smyrna. Is this Smyrna? Myrna would probably have to do with Mary. Yeah? Isis Mary. Um, the, uh, so it says... The word signifying, signifying a bundle of myrrh, Smyrna, the offering made to the sun in the Virgin of August. Because there she is, there's myrrh, Smyrna. Having reference to the fragrant, fragrant posy which she holds in her hand and to the milk pail of the hand of the Isis Omnia of Egypt. A bundle of myrrh is my beloved to me. That's what the Christ says to this church. The seventh congregation, Laodicea, the last of the summer months, that is, of the Asiatic uh, churches, is Laodicea. That word signifying um, the just or righteous people, living, as you see, in the scales of justice. Libra, the balance of September when the weather is neither hot nor cold but lukewarm, for which Christ, who, like Christians, had no notion of justice, threatens, spew it out of his mouth. Because they had lukewarm water in their mouths. He said oh, he threatened to spew it out of their mouths. This is the lukewarm part of, of summer, he's saying, and the justice. So you've got Ephesus, or Jesus, Jesus, in Mars. Thyatira which is the frankincense offered in this month. Philadelphia, brotherly love. Um, Pergamos, the height. That's the height. The month of the height, the highest. Cancer. Sardis, which is Eleon, the lion. The name Sardis tells you it's the lion. Myr and Laodicea. Now I can go on and on and on with these things, and I did mention the word on, <laughs> on and on. When you turn the light on, on was the name for, for the sun in Egypt. It's the one. It's the soul. That's what the, the, the name of sun is, isn't it? The solo, yeah? Or it's called Apollo. Any Greeks? According to Macrobius, Apollo's name is related to the sun. Remember I said he named all those Dionysus, Sabasius, Horus, Pan, Saturn, Jupiter. They're all names for the sun, right? So he's saying here, of course, Apollo. Pollux and Castor, Apollo is up here. <coughs> is related to the sun by many different paths of understanding, which I shall pursue in order. Plato writes that the sun was named Apollo as though from Apollentas Actinas, that is, from casting his rays, because he is not one of fire's many pollon, lowly substances, for the first letter of his name keeps its negative force. 
So what he's saying is that's the A, the A privative or the A privative, right? When you put, for instance, a Gnostic is one who knows, right? And ag or well, you're agnostic. You can do that with with anything, moral, amoral, you know. Um, well, so what he's saying is Apollo. Apollo means many. Poli. In Greek they say poli, heaps, many. Right? So Apollo means many. This is what Plato's saying, it's not me. He's saying uh, <coughs> Macrobrius in the 4th century. Uh, the first letter of his name keeps its negative force, or because the sun is not one and not many, poli, for Latin too, called him sun, Sol, because he is uh, he is alone. Solus is so bright. That's the word solus. He is alone. Okay, so these are just handy things to um, keep in mind uh, as I read from Dupuy. <laughs> Dupuy was um, Napoleon's right one of his friends. And uh, he exposed um, in this book the origin of all religious worship. Um, and he also uh, contains a description of the zodiac of Dendra. This is the zodiac of Dendra. In there he talks about <coughs> the universal religion. And he says, I shall not pursue these reflections further because my object in this work was not that of pointing out all the mistakes of ignorance and the imp impudence of imposture, but to trace the Christian religion back to its true origin, to show its affiliation, to explain the bond which unites it to all the others, and to prove that it is also included within the circle of the universal religion or of the worship rendered to nature and to the sun as its principal agent. How beautiful those words. Aren't they just magic? Uh, I just I marvel that you know we've had these shining lights in our culture but the priestcraft have made sure that you know you don't go reading these books. They're from the devil. Yes. And he, he was very scathing toward the uh, priest. You think I'm scathing. I'm, I'm mild. <laughs> I'm pretty mild. Um, because it's, it's an aberration when you wake up and when you see these things. You see all of these things, man. They're standing out. I, I don't put them there. You know, I, I, this is, look at that. You know, that's there. The setting sun right there on the scales. Balance. A scorpion right there to bite the sun. A lamb, the wool of the lamb being the blossom, the bull to plough. It's all on cue. I, you know, I didn't do that. Judas. Uh, <clears throat> finally, there are a great many people so badly organised that they believe everything except that which is dictated by common sense and sound reason and who are as much afraid of philosophy as the hydrophobist is of water. Those will not read our pages, and we shall not care much about it. We repeat that we did not write for them. Their mind is of the uh, pasture of priests, the same as corpses are of worms. We only write for our true friends of humanity and reason. The rest belongs to another world. And truly their God said to them that this kingdom was not of this world or in other words of the world where people will reason. And that blessed are those who are poor in spirit because the kingdom of heavens belongs to them. Let them have their chimeras and let us not envy the priest for such a conquest. Let us pursue our way without stopping to count the, me the more or less suffrages which may be obtained by thus offending credulity. And after having laid bare the sanctuary wherein the priest shuts himself up, let us not expect 
that he will invite those whom he cheats to read our work. Yeah, they're not going to invite, you know, there's no priest going to say, hey, listen, you want to know about the, uh, the true Prisca theology? Read, uh, read Dupuy, he's done a, done a great job. No, the priest is going to say, I've got some books for you. Ooh, he's going to love indoctrinating that. <clears throat> and a lot more too. A lot more than that is he going to serve up to that poor child. They've been exposed. The day for fiction is over. Okay, This has busted them. Cursey Graves. Cursey Graves. That's the same book I read from before. Uh, 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 same author, Cursey Graves. He wrote in his book, The, the World's 16 Crucified Saviors, he wrote to the clergy way back then, and he said, your game's over. You've been busted. What are you doing? Why don't you go away? Well, the reason they won't go away is because the elites need them. You know, <laughs> the elites pump a lot of money into the 30,000 fictional Christian religions. They're corporations. They're all doing business. They are corporate entities, all registered with the Securities Stock Exchange Commission in New York, as is our country. Everything in this country is registered in New York. This is one of the states of New York. This is what they do. The people put money, the elites, into their fiction because it serves them. It makes fools and buffoons and slaves of people and little sheep that they can shear. You know, they can uh, fleece and pull the wool over their eyes and lead them to the, the, the slaughter like lambs. There's 30,000 registered ones of these. And they get away with their buffoonery by calling themselves charitable organisations. That's what we're doing, but we're registered with the government. Um, well, that's because you have to. You know, I've, I've talked to Jehovah's Witnesses and, and, and such like, you know, uh, mind-controlled idiots. Um, and, and, I've, and I have to say that because a lot of these were my friends. I've known, I've known in Melbourne, they all know me. I used to serve in the Portuguese-speaking congregation for two years. Served in an Italian-speaking congregation for four years. I've served as a regular pioneer and a ministerial servant. I mean, they all knew me. Now, I've got congregations of people that know me. I used to go around all around Melbourne giving public talks. Uh, I was zealous. It's, it's the same. So, give, give me a child to the age of seven. Yeah, they want them before the age of yeah, seven. seven. Yeah. Sodomise them good and proper. Yeah. They do. But uh, I remember just recently speaking in the mall with a couple of these buffoons and, and I pointed out to them that their uh, church is a corporation registered, uh, registered and everything and, and this is, oh yeah, well that's, you've got to, otherwise you can't function. Yeah. Go and talk to some of these um, uh, Quakers and, 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 and some of these uh, real, true uh, spiritual religions that are unregistered and they're looking after their flock all right. You don't have to be registered. <laughs> Registering, it means the government then tells you what to do. When you get a gun license, when you get any kind of license or registration, you're begging to the, hmm, let's see. Would that be the word king? Yeah, so we have to be registered. Uh, uh, in order, as a corporation, uh, in order uh, to function, in order to steal your frickin' money. <laughs> That's what it's for. I mean, you look at the Watchtower and Track Society headquarters, right? Have a look at the mega properties that they've got. They're worth billions. They own a, uh, a corporation called uh, Rand Cam Corporation. They own 51% uh, shares in it, and that corporation makes military machines. Yeah. That's the Jehovah's Witnesses that come knocking on your door. Hello, we'd like to talk about Jehovah to you and see if you can be brainwashed and mind controlled like me. Uh, <coughs> that's the time to send them a running. Rand Cam Corporation. Uh, have a look at um, <coughs> silentlambs.org. Ex-Jehovah's Witnesses, they were involved in the writing department for 30 years at the headquarters in Brooklyn and they saw all the pedophilia and all the protecting of, of pedophiles. Check them out. Check them out. 
Oh, it's all of them. They are all pedophiles. Yeah. They protect pedophiles because they deal with pedophilia in house. They don't deal with it. They don't get the cops in. They don't get the, the law and the justice and say, hey, one of our brothers has just abused this woman's young child and she's, uh, you know, a, mother, uh, she's a, um, uh, a widow. And, and, and look, and grab him. Oh, no. What the Jehovah's Witnesses do is they say, we must protect Jehovah's reputation, brothers. These big old Jehovah's going, don't you dob that pedophile in because my reputation's all on the line here. You know, it's, it's, it's putrid and their fiction is up. It's over. It's all over. For those poor churchgoers that are still going to church to be sodomized and abused and, and, and deceived, um, what the outcome for them is, oh, I don't know. But they will, never, they will never receive the glorious ascension. Because in order to ascend... Uh, people must acknowledge the Christ within. Yeah. Whilst you make an idol, and Leonardo da Vinci said, I would wish I had the words to censure those who place a man as their God instead of paying the reverence to the Son. Because the Son, see, people don't realise, Christians say, oh, that's the creation. You don't worship the creation. Well, the creation... Everything in the creation is conscious. That son, Solus, he happens to be the Mi Michael, the archangel. It's an entity. The Neoplatonists taught that. There are three sons. Paracelsus taught that. There's the spiritual son, the psychic son, and the physical son. And as the sun's rays come to us, there's, there's certain rays that we can't see. We only see that little sp thin spectrum. Above that, ultraviolet and infrared we can't see but they come from the sun they nourish our spirituality and our psychic soul the psychic soul and the spiritual body but the physical photons they nourish our physical body we are nourished in all things light partakes of three natures that's why light is the mediator that's why Jesus says I am the light of the world no one goes to the Father except through me because how can the spirit know the matter if there's not light to shine and to show it. They can't interact. The light is the intermediary. It's the intermediary between the Father and the creation. The waters above and the waters below. See, this is water. Fire is water. What, what's, it, what's it got in there? It's got, um, say, hydrogen is... is uh, well, no, hydrogen is, is, um, is flammable, isn't it? Yep. And so is oxygen, isn't it? But when you put the two together, what do you get? You get water. So that's just water. That's the waters above and the waters below. And God created all of nature, the waters above and the waters below. And physics tells you that everything has these six shapes in the universe. This, this is it. Ad atoms can be a hexa hexahedron, icosahedron, octahedron, tetrahedron, dodecahedron. This science, this, this is, it's, it's imbued in, in, in all of our... Um, in all of our works, in all of our mythologies. It's all there. This is a set science. It, it, it can never be... See, you can never have... Um, it, Pisces can never be there. If you're born anywhere in this period, you're Aryan and that's that. I was born on the 24th of March, I'm Aryan, I'm not Pisces. No matter how many people say, oh, but the equinox is in... No, this is the science. It all has to do with the position of the sun. It doesn't have to do with the backdrop, which are just pictures to tell the story. They're just pictures. All these are pictures. That's all they are. And um, what they picture is how the sun journeys through the ecliptic and he makes all these seasons, 12 different seasons, 12 different natures. You see, and as we come out of the age of Pisces, the feet, and enter into the age of Aquarius, Aquarius and Capricorn are both ruled by Saturn. You see, Jupiter in Pisces, he's about to give over the kingdom to his father Satan, Saturn. Saturn's going to take over. And all the philosophers, all of them, they've always longed for Saturn's return. Because Saturn rules the golden age, you see. And what happens is Saturn loses his kingdom. He gives it to Jupiter in Sagittarius. Right? And then we go through the ages. These are 2,000 year slots. Right? 6,000 years ago, we were in the age of Taurus in the neck. Aries was 2,000, sorry, Gemini 6,000. Taurus 4,000 years ago. Aries... 2,000 years ago, we are now at the end of Pisces about here, 
ready to hand over into Aquarius. So Saturn lost his kingdom many years ago. Jupiter took it off him and Jupiter gives it back to him. And that's what we're waiting for. You see, Capricorn, if you go way back, we're in Pisces now, if we go way back to Capricorn when Saturn last ruled, we got a long time before, he, before Jupiter gives it back to Saturn in Aquarius. And that's what these guys are talking about. These guys are talking about this science. If you don't understand the science, you're making a fool of yourself and everyone who you attempt to teach. Um, look, I want to recommend this book, um, Dealing with the Myths. This is phenomenal. And in here it talks about um, Samson. Now, Samson is Shimshem, the little son. And he, of course he gets betrayed by Delilah and, and he gets killed. You know, he puts his hand on the two pillars and brings down the temple. That's the year. He brings down the year. This is the temple. Temple of God, the twelve pillars. Um, he does something very interesting. One of his labours. You know, Her Hercules does similar labours. He has to kill the Numean lion, etc. Samson kills the lion, right? Um, well, Samson does something pretty interesting. He has this wedding, you know, and he uh, invites all his mates, and he's got thirty mates there, and he proposes a riddle. And they said, if you guess the riddle, uh, I'll give you an undergarments. So some underwear, pretty good, yeah, new underwear, that's nice, you need that. And, uh, and some cloaks or something or some undergarment, uh, uh, overgarments of some, some kind, I forget, uh, perhaps it's in here, here we go. Samson made a feast at his wedding which lasted for seven days. The sun and seven, mm. it's never like, it's never like Jesus and his 13 apostles or King Arthur and his four apostles, you know, or um, uh, 15 tribes of Israel. It doesn't work, right? See, it's already in here. It's got to be 12. The mind of the universe is 12. 12. Dodecahedron. Ether. That's the mind working on the matter. You know? At this feast, there were brought 30 companions. 30? Hmm. 30 degrees of a, tr of a slice of the pie, to be with him, unto whom he said, I will now put forth a riddle unto you, and ye shall certainly declare it. And if ye shall certainly declare it, me, within the seven days of the feast, and I find it out, then I will give you 30 sheets and 30 changes of garments. Boy, generous. But if ye cannot declare it me, then shall ye give me thirty sheets and thirty changes of garments. And they said unto him, Put forth the riddle, that we may hear it. And he answered them, Out of the eater came forth meat, and out of the strong came forth sweetness. That's when he ate honey out of the carcass of the lion, right? Well, interesting what he does, because they guessed the riddle. Dang. He's going to have to go and get some underwear. So, what does he do? Well, what, what does a man of God do? I mean, this, this is the judge of Israel now. Right? We're talking respectable here. Okay, he's a decent, God-fearing judge, right? So, what does he do? Oh, Samson was then at a loss to know where to get the 30 sheets. I don't know, I, I tend to go down to Target. and you know, there's, there's always a shop when I you know, walk around a bit. Doesn't take long. I mean, I'm sure he could have taken a month off to find a shop, right? Because he's a man of God. But this is what he does. Uh, and he goes down to Ashkelon. At the 30, but the spirit of the Lord came upon him. Must be a beautiful spirit. And took their spoil. Ah, sorry. And the, the spirit of the Lord came upon him and he went down to Ashkelon and slew 30 of them and took their spoil and gave change of garments unto them which expounded the riddle. So he off with their yeah. So he grabs a club and he goes down to Ashkelon and he finds himself 30 blokes and he says, right, line up. Yep, line up. Donk, 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 donk. 
pulls off their smelly underwear, right? I hope he washed them. Grabs their sheets and takes them back to his buddy and, buddies and says, uh, you know, as a God-fearing man, I've honoured my, uh, my promise. There you go. There's your undies. And off he goes. That's what a man of God would do, wouldn't it? So, so this is what's going on. We're teaching our children uh, these literal stories and horrifying them rather than teaching them that here's the story, it's not literal, but we're going to teach you the beautiful lesson of it once you master the stories. Then we'll give you... Well, well, it's all about the son conquering, the son, Samson, conquering the, the various signs. You see, when he goes through, kills the lion, that's when he's going through Leo, the sign of Leo, that's in the summer, and the lion is being slaughtered. The blood of the lamb is when the sun goes through March, April and sli slays the lamb and the lamb is given on behalf of the children of Israel and the scapegoat of Israel. These are all symbolisms of the stars, you see, because as those stars come back round all the time, there are seven heroes in here, okay? Hercules is in there, Ephucus is in there, Orion in Taurus, Perseus in Aries, uh, Cephas in Pisces, they're all there and as they come around every year you watch for them, ah Perseus has come up, right, that means something and he's always the coming one, that's why Jesus is Jesus, the coming one because as those heroes come up they all represent Jesus, they all represent the sun because the sun is in them, it's the sun in them that makes them the hero, so when the sun is in Scorpio he's glorifying the Fucus and Hercules and, and that is Hercules in, in the sky and he's performing his 12 labours. The sun is always labouring as it goes around. It goes through and slays the beasts that it lives with and, and, and revitalises the seasons for us. And it's going through our bodies. Um, there's a situation where Samson grabs 300 foxes. That's one of his exploits. And uh, he puts torches on their tail. Right? And he lights those torches and he sends them through the field. Well, I wonder what that's all about. Okay. This is interesting, isn't it? Um, and by the way, there was another judge, Gideon, who had uh, 300 men. 300 and 300. I wonder why these numbers keep reappearing, which reminds me. I'll read something interesting from Joseph Atwell's book in a minute. Please do not uh, let me forget that before I close, because this is what it's all about. Joseph Atwell, please find out who invented, who invented the literal story of Jesus Christ. Flavius, Josephus, did I say Flavius? Uh, would that be the Flavian dynasty uh, of uh, Vespasian, Titus and Domitian? Yes, it would be. They are the people who destroyed Jerusalem, the Caesars of Rome. They created the Jesus story to enslave Rome and all of her conquests. Now you can see Joseph Atwell speak on YouTube. He's, he's, he's doing there's lots of his beautiful presentations where he explains and he's called this book The Roman Conspiracy to Invent Jesus. It is an invention, pure and sweet. Yeah. The bigger you tell them, the bigger they fall. And people will kill you if you deny it. They will thrust a sickle in your eye the moment you deny their historical Jesus. Why? because of that composite guilt, um, uh, you, you could say, the consciousness of the fact that he didn't exist. Coming through history, coming through, it's a lie. That's why they kill you for it. They, they will kill you for it because they've got no other defence. They can't say, oh, here's the proof. Hang on. Let's go to Tacitus and Suetonius and Josephus and all of these, Pliny the Younger, and give you real, real proof. Let's go and do that, shall we? Yeah. So, so what they've done is, <laughs> in, rather than giving any proof, they kill you. That's, that's a pretty... Samson did it. Why not? <laughs> anyway, I'll just finish this real quickly and then I'll finish that and uh, away we go. What happens with those foxes? Why is uh, Samson lighting up? I mean, would you really do that? Would you really do that? It, 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 it's not really physically going to happen, is it? I mean, Samson's not really going to go and kill 30 blokes for their undies. It's not going to happen. <laughs> Please, Sunday school. Uh, yeah, good, strong pair of bonds. Yeah. 
Surely he could have gone down to the lingerie shop and bought some undies for his friends. <laughs> God, no, they, I think we need to uh, perhaps show um, the life of Brian in, Brian in all the 30,000 registered uh, corporate Christian churches. Would have you found it funny when you were a uh, No, I found it funny. I was pretty open-minded, yeah. I did a lot of this study way back then, you know. I, read, I was reading uh, Emmanuel Velikovsky, uh, Alexander Hislop, The Two Babylons. I was going to share something out of this. The Two Babylons by Alexander Hislop. This is an amazing volume. He wrote this in uh, 1913, proving that Rome is Babylon Mark II. Anyway, look, I won't read it, but the fire is, has to do with the, um, the frost of April and Sirius coming up and everything, and they, they always used to burn burn the fields and foxes were a part of it. It's just a, you know, it's just a solar lunar religious um, tradition. That's what Samson with his 30, uh, 300 foxes is all about. Now, in this book, I really do recommend you, you read that if you want to. Um, another good book that I want to recommend is Christian Astrology. This is from the 15th century people. Uh, William Lilly. William Lilly, Christian, Christian, astrology, Christian astrology. Chiasmus, this is a good book. It talks about the form history in the Bible. It's talking about um, folklore that was, that was developed over many, many millennia, which, which created forms and shapes of literary works. So, and, and they are called form history. You see, he says, form history is a pre preliminary study to history of literature. Its centre of interest is not the Gospels as they now exist, but in the small component parts of the Gospels. These parts have had a long history before they were entered and written Gospels. The writer of the Gospel does not create these sections. They are the work of the folk spirit operating unconsciously in, shaping, in the shaping of the material. The writer merely acts as an editor. You see, what they're doing is they're, um, they're, they're giving transvaluative uh, force to those folklore traditions. That's what they're doing, and it's in the Bible. He calls it form history. And, he, and it's beautiful because he goes to point out how the synoptic gospels all have Jesus at uh, birth, at the age of 12, and at the age of 30. They all seem to have amnesia about what happened in between. And he's showing and he's proving by such means that the gospels are just form history. They're just doing this. You know, it's all part of locked into the solar, the solar cycle. You know, and he, he proves it. That's chiasmus. But uh, Caesar's Messiah is a beauty. Um, he shows how Joseph and uh, Esther and Mordecai had so many similarities. How about this? Joseph rises to high position in the Egyptian government through his beauty and wisdom. Esther rises to a high position in the Persian government through her beauty and wisdom. Joseph's good deed interpreting the butler's dream is forgotten for a long time. Mordecai's good deed, saving the king's life, is forgotten for a long time. Is there some form of history going on here, or is, am I just imagining things? Hmm. A character refuses to listen. Character refuses to listen. She spoke of Joseph every day, but he refused to listen. They told him every day, but he refused to listen. Remember the, um, the guys that were in jail. Uh, sorry, the, um, the, guy, the baker and the, um, the wine bearer were granted back their positions in, Ser in Pharaoh's court. You see, they were in jail with Joseph. He had the dreams and everything. And he said to them, when you get out, you make sure you remind the king of my injustice, that I was put in prison for an injustice. Um, and that's what, that's what it's saying there. They told him every day, but he refused to listen. Or, sorry, they spoke of Joseph every day, but they refused to listen. The same with Esther. Pharaoh's chief servant is hanged. The king's chief servant is kang hanged. Remember, Mordecai got the chief's... Haggai, I think his name was. Uh, not, what was his name? Uh, ha Haggai, I think it was. Um, Hamar, sorry. Hamar was the, the, um, the guy that was hanged. 
I might be wrong. Uh, Joseph reveals his identity to Pharaoh after a feast. Esther reveals her identity to the king after a feast. These are major stories in the Bible, man. <laughs> you know, this, the, Esther, the story of Esther in, in Medo-Persia in the kingdom where she, where she married the king of, because of the beauty and Joseph, how he became the second in charge of Egypt because of his beauty. It's all form history. Um, for instance, the Old Testament and the New, Jesus and Moses, any similarity? Uh, Pharaoh wanted to kill the little children. Herod wanted to kill the little children. Moses fleed from Egypt. Jesus had to flee to Egypt and, and come back again from Egypt. Um, Joseph takes the name of Israel. Uh, sorry, Joseph takes, sorry, um, takes old Israel down to Egypt. Uh, Joseph, the father of Jesus, brings new Israel down to Egypt. Right? So, Joseph, the father of Jesus, brings him down to Egypt, right? But um, Joseph takes his father, Israel, down to Egypt. This is just, this is just staggering, and it goes on and on and on. Um, Pharaoh massacres boys, Herod massacres boys. All the men are dead. Remember that in, uh, an angel came to Joseph and said, you can go back to Jerusalem because all the men that wanted to kill your son, they are dead. And so re they returned to Nazareth, right? Well, that's the same with Moses. They said, oh, the Pharaoh that was persecuting and wanted to kill you, he's dead. You can go back to Egypt. <laughs> Man, you know, kids can pick this up. It's childish. It's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. Um, <clears throat> passing through the water, Jesus' baptism. Tempted by bread, tempted by bread. Remember, Moses was tempted by bread in, in the wilderness. Do not tempt God. Jesus also said, do not tempt God. Worship only God. Jesus also said, worship only God. And the list goes on and on and on. On and on. Um, look, I'd like to close with um, some encouragement on a few other uh, uh, products and people that you can uh, look up and reference for this knowledge. Okay? Um, the Pyramid Code is a brilliant product um, dealing with the true origins of Egypt. This is where Hermes, this is where it comes from. And, and, and in here, they, um, Carmen Bootler produced this and she's done a marvellous job. In here, she interviewed Abdel Hakim Awian, the uh, indigenous wisdom keeper, who passed away in about 2007. And he was the... Um, the, the man, he's the man that's interviewed in here, so you can grab his wisdom. He was one of the, you know, the, one, the, the people who are directly in line, a, 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 an origine from, from Egypt. And um, he inspired these books. So um, Stephen Miller went down to Abdel and Hakim and um, uh, interviewed him and got a lot of wisdom from him. And these books are showing the true history of Egypt being, you know, minimum 50,000, 60,000 years old pre-dynastic. Now I'm going to be doing a tour of um, Egypt. I just want to uh, mention this. I'm doing this because I want to bring people's attention to the school more than anything. I mean the fact that they're holding a, um, a tour is exceptional I think. Um, so you can look it up on their website. That is the um, chemetology.com. Okay. Kemet is uh, K-H-E-M. Chem. Chem is the word for chemistry, right? Comes from Noah's son, Ham, Cam, Black. Chemistry. So this is the Commission School of Ancient Mysticism. So I'm going to be a, a, a guest speaker with the son of Abdel Hakim Awian and his wife, Patricia Awian. And we're going to be speaking in Egypt um, and, go, and visiting all the pre dynastic sites. Okay, showing the true origin of this. This has got to get out there because it's, as Giordano Bruno said, unless we go back to Hermes, the world is doomed because this is scientific wisdom. It's our wisdom. We deserve it. We own it. The elites have come and thwarted it and given us a corrupt, uh, fictional, antichrist system. And that antichrist has been murdering people all over the world, in Africa, Christians are behind all the bloodshed with their corporations. Uh, they conquered the Americas and slew millions, if not hundreds of millions of indigenous people. This land, they, they destroyed. And it wasn't the Hermetists that went before them, by the way. It was the Calvinists. 
and the Protestants. You see, they destroyed the spirit of the Renaissance, the Renaissance, or in Italian we say the Rinascimento, because Hermes, Marsilio Ficino had just tra translated the, Herm the Corpus Hermeticum, and Europe was alight with illumination, and the Renaissance flowered. But then guess what happened? Martin Luther, bang, 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 there's 90 theses, right? And they call it the Reformation. And then the Catholics quickly in the early 1500s set about the counter-reformation and founded the Jesuits and countered the Reformation. It's just a distraction. It's just a corporate distraction from Hermes. And then the Hermetists fled to America and founded the Constitutional Republic of the United States of America. The democracy of the United States, which is a corporation, that was founded in the 1870s. And that was the Vatican. That's Vatican and elite corporations, the biggest corporation in the world, and their services are war. So they want to stop this. They want to stop this information. So the corporation of the United States, President Barack Obama, is a war-mongering organisation. That's what it does, war. Uh, and its, its enemy is the Constitutional Republic of Hermes. Because Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Paine, Thomas uh, Jefferson, George Washington, they were all Freemasons. They were all Illuminists and, and Hermetists. Okay? So please understand the difference, and that's what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be actually discussing um, the pre-dynastic history of Egypt, and the truth is coming out. That, this truth is coming out. The day of the fiction is over. Rome has to surrender her fiction, because she can't keep the lies. In fact, look, They've hoarded so many millions of books and, and scrolls and put them in the Vatican Library and there, which actually have the truth of this. And the time has come for uh, probably possibly occupy the Vatican and um, possibly uh, deal some justice to the cardinals and the Pope and the biggest corporation in the universe and uh, grab those scrolls and enlighten mankind with what's in there because this is the stuff that is our salvation. It's the true science of as above, so below.